All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now 6 p.m. I'm going to ask if we could gradually move to our seats so we can begin in a moment. All right, I'm going to ask if we could please close the doors in the back so we can have uh, some silence. And if we could, IT, begin the broadcast. Give me a thumbs up. That was a thumbs up. Fantastic. The broadcast has begun. This meeting is called to order. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City of Boynton Beach City Commission meeting. Today is Tuesday, January 16th. Can you believe it? It is 2024, and the time is now 6.01 PM. Now, before we begin, uh, any further, I want to remind everyone of our rules of civility and decorum. Officials must first be addressed by the chair, not interrupt a speaker. Public comments must be addressed to the commission as a whole and not to any individual on the dais or in the audience. Personal tax insults, displays of rudeness and lack of respect are strictly prohibited. Disruptive behaviors from the audience, including but not limited to yelling, stamping of feet, and similar demonstrations are likewise prohibited. Please govern yourselves accordingly as offenders may be removed from the meeting. All right, city clerk, if you could please begin the roll call. Mayor Panserga. Here. Vice Mayor Turkin. Present. Commissioner Cruz. Here. Commissioner Hay. Here. Commissioner Kelly. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, our invocation for this evening will be led by Pastor Dwayne Roberts from Calvary Chapel. Is he here this evening? Pastor Dwayne, there you are. And followed by our Pledge of Allegiance, led by Commissioner Amy Kelly. Pastor, if you could lead us, and after which we will do the pledge. Let's all stand for the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you have allowed us to see a new year. And we don't know what the new year is going to bring, but we know that you are ahead of us. And so over this meeting and for all of the subsequent things, we will talk about the agenda that we will be presiding over today. We pray for collective hearts, uh, unity. We pray for wisdom, equity, fairness. I pray for all those that are going to be leading us, the city of Boynton Beach, but I also pray for the, the citizens of Boynton Beach. I pray for an overall safety this year and we would see progress. We thank you again for allowing us to see another day. We thank you for... They're very small breaths in our lungs even now. We thank you for this evening. May you continue to lead us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Dwayne. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. We're now moving on to agenda approval. I'll begin on my left uh, with Commissioner Kelly, additions, deletions, or corrections to the agenda. Commissioner? No, Mayor, I don't have any. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hay? No, I do not have any. All right. Vice Mayor? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to add um, just a topic of discussion for if any of us want to go to NLC DC this March. It's coming up. And so I know we need to have consensus for any of those who are going. So I just want to get that on there. Absolutely. Um, to my colleagues, is that a conversation you're ready to have today? You're going to do it next meeting. We do have one more meeting until that March. Um, so either one. I'm prepared. To you're have prepared today. today? Yeah. All right. So okay. Vice Mayor, I just want to be absolutely clear. You're looking for consensus on who wants to go and, if who, and, and all of that. Yeah, correct. Just because I think the price can the price increases the closer you get. So I just True. want to early be... Bird, early bird pricing. Correct, yes. Right. Good point. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor. Was there anything else? Uh, no, no, no. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Cruz. No amendments for me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to Council. Council, there was uh, an update to one of the items. Yes, on item 6K, there was a Scrivener's error in the resolution. Um, it said an amount twenty-five dollars to seventy-five thousand dollars, I believe, in the second paragraph, and it should be twenty-five thousand to fifty thousand dollars. Just for clarification, we've updated it, but we didn't get a time to put it in the system. So the resolution actually will reflect fifty thousand dollars signature authority. Okay, so again, that's six K 
for 50,000, that is the updated number, Correct. 6K. All right, was there anything else from staff, city manager? Okay, uh, we have a motion to approve the agenda as amended so with moved. the NLC discussion. Second. And the update to 6K. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor to amend, to approve the agenda as amended, say aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. We're now turning to informational items by members of the city commission. Uh, let's turn to Commissioner Cruz. I have no informational items today. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor, any um, events, updates? Uh, yes, I did attend uh, the MLK event yesterday. I did attend uh, Palm Beach County Days in Tallahassee. I think we have a very strong chance of getting millions of dollars back um, from appropriation requests from uh, the strategy we took. Had a great time. I know Commissioner Cruz, Commissioner Kelly, you guys were there. And it was uh, very, very cool to see how things work in Tallahassee. Great conversation with Ballard Partners. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll uh, save the taxpayers a few million dollars and get some projects done. Great. Um, and then also um, disclosures. Uh, when it comes to Next. items, we can do the disclosures when we get to the public okay. hearing. Perfect. Yeah, let's Thanks. do that. Um, Commissioner Hay. I did attend uh, MLK Day on yesterday. It was a great event. And I really want to commend uh, the staff uh, for putting up the, the tents, uh, even though we didn't, we didn't have a bright sunshine, but it was uh, uh, going forward, that, that layout is just great. We had two, two tents, uh, huge tents with chairs in the, in, in the middle, and uh, I got a lot of com com comments about that, very positive. So when we do have these events in the summertime, I think it would be deeply appreciated. So thanks staff again for coming up with that layout. Thank you. Thank you, and Commissioner Kelly. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I attended Palm Beach County Days and uh, thankfully, I think right now we're safe in any um, hard bills that we have to fight about. So that's good to hear and that we were really just going up there and, um, and asking for, for appropriations. So hopefully um, we will get some of that. Um, I also wanted to just um, quickly recognize the fire department. I did, um, they did a beach, they hosted a beach cleanup, um, gosh, two weekends ago um, on their own, um, you know, by their own choice and by their own um, willingness to be a part of the community and to serve the community. And um, I think, Chief, what you had 40 or 50 fam, you know, between firefighters and families and children, and um, it was an amazing turnout for FD um, and for the city, and we were at Oceanfront Park, and uh, as beautiful as our beach is, it, it, is, uh, it can always use a good beach cleanup. So just thank you, Chief, for, for your guys for organizing that. It was, a, it was a great event. Thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner Hay, you want to add something? I just wanted to add uh, uh, hats off also to the Parks and Rec uh, Department. We had the uh, cleanup, I believe it was Saturday morning at 8, and uh, that was, uh, we had a great turnout. And I like the, uh, the layout schematic. Um, we only went around one huge block. Next year, I think we were, I'd like to recommend that we also go down MLK to US-1 and, and back, either the same route or go a different route back to uh, Carolyn Sim Center. But the overall uh, positive attitude about it, everybody was ready to continue to walk even more. So Casey, <laughs> next year let's extend it just a little bit more, okay? Thank you. I'll add on to that, Commissioner Hay. It was a well-organized event. Uh, people loved it, people were having a great time and uh, that's what it's about. And cleaning the neighborhood. So so thank you and thank you to everybody. Uh, if there's nothing else, any updates, uh, uh, just, Vice Mayor? I, I'm, I'm sorry, firefighters, I couldn't make it to the beach cleanup. I had drill that weekend. Um, I know I, uh, I had started that conversation, I'll be at the next one. But it was a great, uh, looked like a great turnout. And uh, I do want to recognize Erica Whitfield, school board member. She's in the audience. So, yep, that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you. We are moving on to the next portion of the agenda. Perfect segue. This is the State of Education Report by District 4 School Board Member Erica Whitfield, who is joining us this evening. And 
Do we need to load a PowerPoint, Ms. Whitfield? Or no, sir. It's all good? I, all no, right. I Begin have a when you are ready. Hatred of PowerPoints. <laughs> 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 Thank you all so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Erica Whitfield. I'm on your school board. I've been there for nine years now, so hopefully I can answer any questions you have. Um, I've brought with me some information um, just to share with you some of the things that are going on. But really, the reason I come to see you is just to keep the lines of communication open between our school board and your commission so that if you have any concerns about your schools, you can ask. Ask me anything, you know, privately, publicly, whatever you want. So I really appreciate you um, just taking this time for me to be able to speak to you. Um, the things that I want to talk to you really quickly about today are some of the things that um, I was also in Palm Beach County Days this week. It was really nice to see all of you there. Um, I did go and I um, talked a lot about kindergarten readiness, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about some of the other legislative priorities we have, specifically around the vouchers and funding of the school system. Um, so in your conversations, if you're having any with legislators, you could also support in um, our uh, legislative priorities um, as they relate to your schools. Um, and then I just want to talk about um, some of the other concerns that we have um, around some of the legislation that they have. Um, out there right now. So first thing is kindergarten readiness. This is something that I think our municipalities can really get engaged in and I want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to be a part of this. Last year we really noticed that there was an issue around um, parents not knowing when their schools were registering kids for kindergarten. We always do it at what we used to call kindergarten roundup, but now it's actually called kindergarten kickoff. We've changed that a little bit. We've rebranded it and kind of asked all of our schools to um, do it within the same week so we can market it as well. And so what I would ask, um, we are going to be sending you information from the school district to let you know when your kindergarten kickoffs are going to be. And then hopefully you guys can get it out on your social media as well, because a lot of the parents that have kindergartners are not already engaged with us. They're engaged with you, but they haven't yet engaged with us. So we want to make sure that all children have the ability to um, sign up early for kindergarten. One of the best things about that that many parents don't know, and I'm going to give you all a, a quick hint, is that um, the after school programs fill up very quickly. Quickly. And so if you're there on the kindergarten kickoff day, you can sign up first. And so make sure that you get your kid's name and you have an after school program from the be a part of. We don't have enough seats for every child who's in elementary school to stay after school every day. Sometimes it's not needed, but many parents would like that to happen. Um, and then when it's, once it fills up, then you can go to um, some of the nonprofit partners or you could even just go there to start. So we have... Um, done a lot of work around kindergarten readiness because we've noticed the scores have been struggling in some of our um, communities in uh, Palm Beach County. Boynton Beach is definitely one of them. Lake Worth, Delray, West Palm, the areas that I represent, all of them really are having issues. And so what we do is within the first two weeks of school, every kindergartner takes a test. It's called the Flickers test. It's basically a kindergarten readiness screener. And we can see how our students are doing in that very early part of school. Are they ready to be able to be a part of kindergarten? In our very affluent communities, you'll see numbers in the 80% of the students ready. But in some of our more challenged communities, you're going to see numbers that are 12%, 15%, 25%. So those numbers are not great because then a <coughs> kindergarten teacher has to spend a lot of time catching those students up. And VPK is not a mandate. You don't have to do it. That's why it's V for voluntary. And uh, But I 100% support it. And I send my daughter. And I will send my other daughter. So I, I really think it's very important. And one of the things that I went to Tallahassee about was to ask for a full day of funding for VPK for all of the people that I met with. I think this is a very important bipartisan issue and something that our legislature is actually very interested in taking on. So supporting that, I think, is a very important step for us as a community to be able to have right now we get three hours paid for a day and I think that we should be at least moving in the direction of a full day and they have been interested in possibly going to four or five hours a day it would make such a difference for our families because as any working mom can tell you very difficult to pick up your child at noon um, every day <laughs> so you have to come up with something and we're lucky to have a great early learning coalition here in Palm Beach County that then works with supplements for families that are having struggling to be able to pay that extra bill but then you do have to be able to navigate that system. And I would personally just like it if you, everybody just got four-year-old education for their children. Um, one of the representatives said he was looking for three-year-old education too, and that would just make my heart sing. I think it would do a lot. And when you look at our reading scores across the state, we are struggling with that. And I think getting children involved in education earlier can only do amazing things. So I think it's the next big thing that we have for education and a, one of the ways that we can really change um, the 
tide here uh, in the state of Florida. So the other thing that I really, oh, I wanted to mention. So we actually, one of the things that we did after we set up all of the um, uh, kindergarten kickoffs to be in the same week, when they came, we would give them a kindergarten readiness kit. So they're like preschool kits that talk about letters and numbers. And they went home with every family. It was a two kits. And so after much cajoling, I finally convinced them to give me one. And uh, so I got them for my three-year-old. And we did it together. And we found out she's not ready for kindergarten. And <laughs> it was something that was very enlightening for me to realize the connection between letters and their sounds, the way you recognize a capital letter from a lowercase letter. And to be able to see that through her eyes with the three-year-old and realize that this is definitely a, something that has to be taught and has to be learned. And she's in preschool, but she's obviously not there yet. But it was an amazing thing. And so after we did all this progress, we actually saw that our kindergarten readiness scores throughout the entire state, th sorry, throughout the entire county went up three points. So we know that there's ability to be able to make this happen. So we'll be doing that again this year. So we're very excited about that. Um, one of the things that came out of Tallahassee last year was the voucher program. Many of you have heard of that. The vouchers were um, really allowing any student in the state of Florida to take the funding that the state gives for their education and they can take it to the next, um, to the school of their choice. So a private school, a charter school, wherever they wanna go, we've always had charters. Um, but to be able to move it to private schools without any restrictions on income is a new thing. And this past year, the state allocated $400 million to be able to pay for those funds. And so it wouldn't come out of our bucket of general fund money that we get from the state. All we ask from the state is that they continue to expand those numbers and hold us harmless uh, for those funds because we are concerned that over time this program is gonna grow, people will go to private schools, and we don't want it to reduce the funding that we as a state, as a, a state entity get. So um, that is one of the big requests that we have. So far our things have been good, and so we're just hoping the state will keep that up. But I think it's a very important point for this year. Um, the next thing I want to mention is concordance scores. Uh, Mayor Pinsergo knows this well, I'm sure. Um, the uh, ability for a child to graduate from high school is um, tied in with their, their uh, scores on standardized tests. We have a Florida State test, um, which is our FAST test. And the kids, if they pass that at an appropriate level, they will be able to graduate high school. If they struggle with that, in the past we've been able to use SAT and ACT scores, the same test that everyone in this room probably took when they were in high school. Those scores can sometimes be easier for certain children to get. And so we wanted to make sure that they could use that. Those scores are called concordant scores. They can use them in place of the state test. This past year, um, they raised the rates for what a concordance score is, um, what is considered a passing score for the concordance scores. And so if that goes into effect this year, which they're saying that it will, last year we got a pass on it. If it goes into effect, you're gonna see a hit on all of your high school graduation rates throughout the county. We anticipate as a county that our scores will go down 10 points across the board. So um, they're thinking that it'll get to around 79%, and right now we're in the 90s. So if you um, see that this year, know that I told you about it, I warned you, this is what's happening. We're doing everything we can to try to stem this uh, direction of the education here in Palm Beach County, but it is something we have asked for more flexibility on, um, so that's part of the, the issue as well. Um, one of the other things we asked for that is going to impact you all that I think you should be planning for um, is that we have to change the start times for high school as a health person. I'm very, very into the idea that we, <laughs> that we let kids sleep in longer. Also, as the parent of a uh, high schooler who wakes up every day at 545 and leaves the house by 630, I understand her need for sleep. So I love the idea of adjusting the times. But it is very difficult um, for us with buses to be able to get all the children to school. And so we are going to have to change all of the start times for all of the schools to be able to accommodate this. And so it's going to be a large change. And it's coming to you in 2026. And it's something that I think is going to change traffic patterns all over the county. As you all know, when we have a day off, it's amazing to drive around. And then when schools are in session, everything kind of is up in the air. So I think that's all gonna shift 
um, throughout the state of Florida. It may be good for the health of the kids. It's gonna be very difficult for us to be able to get bus drivers to cover those routes and to be able to get kids to school. So uh, we asked for a little flexibility from the state. That's another thing that we put in our legislative priorities that I think is important for municipalities to know. Um, and then as you see that come up in the next few years, um, you know, we would you know, welcome any input that you have on the best ways to do it. The um, one more thing that I wanted to mention uh, that I think is really important is um, our funding just across the board. Uh, we get a lot of mandates, as I'm sure you do from the state, um, saying that we need to provide many things to our students and to our staff, um, and they're not funded. And so we have provided through the major gift of the community uh, through our referendums, uh, the funding for safety and security. We actually are putting in metal detectors this year in all of our high schools. We've done four already and we have the rest are coming right now. Um, these metal detectors are not like a TSA metal detector. They are more of like a Kohl's metal detector where you can just kind of like go through but it does detect large metal objects. And then we have to have extra staffing to be able to pull students out so that we can check bags as they go in. The four schools that we did it in actually went very well. It was not something that I was excited about, but it's actually gone well. And so um, funding projects like that uh, throughout our schools, very expensive. And so we asked the state to please con consider uh, fully funding our security requirements and additional projects as we need them um, because we do rely on the referendum dollars. Also, um, teacher pay has been a big part of this. We have a referendum that gives additional money for teacher pay. It's very difficult to pay for um, living here in Palm Beach County. Housing has gone up. Cost of everything has gone up. And so we would like to pay our um, our teachers more if we could, and the referendum does that, but to have additional funds from the state is huge. I know that's something that the legislature is thinking about and it and considering even after last year, and so we're hoping that that can, um, that that can continue and more funds can be given. Um, I think I'll stop there and just um, see if you guys have any questions for me or any concerns about your schools that you would like me to answer. Thank you, Ms. Whitfield. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let's begin on my left. Commissioner Kelly, did you have any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, I do have just one on the voucher program. Do you know um, how many students have utilized that since it since the beginning of the school year? Do you have State any? State of Florida? I'm not totally sure, but I can find well, out Well, I mean, for in you. just in Palm Beach County. Like, are we seeing? There's actually, we've been very lucky in Palm Beach County. We thought there was going to be a huge impact, but I think we have really good schools. I, I think that's part of it. So we actually had an increase of students in our system um, of about 1,000 kids when we thought we were going to have quite the hit from that. Um, what we've really seen is that most of the children who were already in private schools are taking those funds. So it wasn't a huge shift over to private schools, but the funding that has been taken and, you know, I have a really good friend whose daughter goes to Benjamin, and I said, you know, you should get this money. You can get $8,000. And so they sent her a check, which was great, but she's been in private school since she was a little kid. So it wasn't like they, she was leaving the public school system to go, um, but she was grateful and thought it was awesome. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's where you're going to see that. And in, last year, we didn't have all of our private schools in Palm Beach County accepting the dollars. They have to say yes. And so I think as this gets more commonplace, you're going to see more private schools saying yes. They're there is a teeny bit of oversight from the DOE and not every private school wants that. Um, but they will, uh, you know, if they participate, then more families will get involved. So I think you'll see a steady growth over the next few years. But we've been doing pretty well in Palm Beach County. I think it really just kind of brings home competition for us. You know, we have to provide the best service. And if we don't, then people will choose to go somewhere else. Right. Um, thank you. And then I, I have on the, um, the school starts time, although I have a high school student, and I am more concerned with the after school activities and how this is going to affect um, internships. You know, we have city internships for, you know, junior and senior high school, or we did last year. Um, this is gonna affect internship programs, school sports. What is the district, because as I understand, high school is not gonna be able to start before 8.30. It's a whole hour shift at least what, I mean, I'm sh and I know that that's a concern at the district level Huge. too as far as what then these students are going to do. I mean, they depend on some kids have after school jobs. Um, and so now you're, it, now this forces them to potentially even work later. And are they really recouping that sleeping in time by so, having to work an hour later 
in order to get the hours to help their families or to have a car or to have a, you know, I mean, so, I mean, those, uh, just in talking to other parents, you know, with high school students, I mean, those are some of the concerns that I had when this came out was that that's all well and good, that they get to sleep an extra hour, maybe, maybe, but then how that affects them at the, on the back end of that is a big concern I think as you're well. 100% right. You've really identified a real problem. The other thing is sports because our fields need to be lit up. So practice fields, if they're there late in the winter and there's no light, how do we get them to practice? I think what you're going to see is some shift to morning hours for both um, employment or um, opportunities for um, you know participation in after school sports may end up moving to the morning hours. We are actually going to have a um, committee that is going to be made up of community members to help us deal with this. I do think it's going to be a huge thing with our community. Um, I mean, I. I've always wanted it to happen because of the health concerns, but the ideal situation would be that every student started at 8, 8.30, and we don't have to shift. But as you know, middle schools right now are doing um, 9.30 many places, and then if we have to shift everybody up, we may have to push them as far as 10, 10.30, because we got to get the buses back and shift them around. Right now, one bus driver does a high school route, and then they drop off the high school kids. They do an elementary route. They drop those kids off and go pick up a middle school route. So one driver does three routes, goes on a break, and then reverses it in the afternoon. So to have that many more bus drivers and that many more buses. I think we could probably buy the buses, but the um, bus drivers are almost impossible to come by, as you all know. So um, we've done everything we can to raise pay, um, raise spirits over there, make sure that they like their jobs. Um, but even with that, this is a huge pull on the system. Um, so I think we're going to need any great ideas that everyone has for this. Um, also, I was just at Milagro Center before I came here. Um, and they do an after-school program that serves some of the children here in Boynton. And they um, are very concerned as well. That's their entire funding model is to have students after school. And how do they provide those services if school doesn't show up until much later in the day? So I think this is going to be a big question going forward. And I do think flexibility from the state would, would help us as we try to figure this out. So we have got a couple years left, which is good. But I do think you know any input uh, from you all is very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Hay, did you have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. I just want to commend you on the job that you guys are doing and looking outside the box to try to resolve some of the issues that we have with our kids. Uh, the question that I have probably ought to um, ask our legal, uh, Shauna Lamb, but, but since I have both of you here, here's the, here's the scenario. Uh, I, I've heard answers both ways, and that's why I'm bringing it up here. I understand the separation of church and state, but what we have is a, a church that has space uh, to rent out to a charter school, and the agreement is to um, co-use. A, a, it's not a conflict with the schedule. Uh, the church will be utilizing on Wednesday night and then Sunday, which they're not there on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have run into any uh, cases like that where it's permitted uh, and or not permitted and from a legal standpoint it's to us we don't see a problem but I, I understand some of Holland church and state and all that good stuff and then there are other cases where they say if you can work it out it's just fine so yeah, what's your opinion uh, have you run into cases of of that type I've seen um, some charter schools run out of churches, and I think it's fine. Um, and especially with this new kind of more open policy from the state, I can imagine it would be okay. We have a charter school department that actually works through all of these issues and makes sure the space is appropriate and that you know funding is there. So there's a whole bunch of things that have to be worked out to create a charter school, but we do have staff on board to be able to help um, people through that process, and we are... You know, I wouldn't say always approving charter schools, but we have them um, come to us frequently. Um, I think we just approved a couple more, or maybe some extensions. So um, we're, you know, I'm happy to help direct you to the right people if that helps. Um, but I don't think the building, you know, what it's also used for, it matters. Good. So 
you guys really wouldn't approve it if there's a problem like that. We try really hard not to, but um, you could actually go to the state also for approval. They've uh, created a, a me mechanism at the state level to create a charter school that doesn't go through the Palm Beach County school system. But um, you know, I would recommend coming through us because we have local staff to help you develop it. Okay, Shano, do you have anything to add to to, to that? I know there's been some case law with regard to, and particularly with regard to post football game prayers. Um, and there was some case law regarding that where they were going to require him not to do the post team prayers on the field. Um, so there, there is some case law and the courts ultimately said that he was allowed to do that so long as it wasn't mandatory. That's something I can certainly look into and, and get you kind of some opinions relating to that. But <clears throat> um, on that particular issue with use of a facility, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn out a vice mayor. Any questions for uh, Ms. Whitfield? Nope, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Whitfield. Commissioner Cruz? We can talk offline. I don't want to, you know, make a lengthy conversation, but... Thank you for coming. I'll be reaching out to you about Congress Middle School, getting their piano, and we've t probably talked about it before, but um, yep, we'll okay. talk in private. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Whitfield, thank you, and thank you for all the hard work that you do. I am certainly uh, watching, and we can see the great work that you're doing, so. Awesome, thank, thank you, you so much. I appreciate you all for having me. We're gonna move on now to the next, one second. Where's that noise coming from? IT, uh, just make sure that everyone's muted. I think that may be the reason. Uh, we're, next item is 3B. It is a proclamation. I see Brother Norfis is in the audience. This is for the Seminole Maroon Remembrance Day, and I had the pleasure of uh, being at your event this past weekend, but I want to present this proclamation here again, and let me read it into the record, and then I want to give you the mic uh, to tell us a little bit more about the history and what it means. So... This is a bit lengthy, so bear with me. Uh, the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas a weekend of activities in honor of the memory of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. will give special recognition to the Seminole Maroon ancestral presence here in Palm Beach County, and whereas the Heart of Boyne Neighborhood Association has partnered with Florida Black Historical Research Project and the African American Research Library and Cultural Center of West Palm Beach to reaffirm the importance of land acknowledgement of local indigenous sites. And whereas the celebratory events to be held January 13th through the 14th, 2024, mark the first anniversary of last year's highly successful and widely received 185th year family reunion in Palm Beach County, which gathered together for the first time Seminole Maroon descendants of Trail of Tears survivors from Oklahoma, Texas, Mexico, the Bahamas, and Florida to their ancestral homeland of Florida. Whereas the 2024 gathering to recognize the history of Seminole Maroons of Palm Beach County and beyond will shed light on past history, assess present challenges and opportunities and lay the groundwork for addressing these findings in the future. And whereas the city of Boynton Beach is committed to preserving the history and to recognizing the ongoing work of the Heart of Boynton Neighborhood Association, the Florida Black Historical Research Project and the African American Research Library and Cultural Center, as they seek to pay tribute to Seminole Maroons as part of the unique cultural history of the city, county, and Florida, now, therefore, I type and circa mayor of the city of Boyne Beach, Florida, do hereby proclaim January 11th through the 15th, 2024, as Seminole Maroon Remembrance Day. Days, plural. So, Brother Norfus, let me present this to you. Let me, let me come down, but do tell us um, what this is all about, because I know not, not a lot of people are aware, right? They're not. <laughs> Okay, my name is uh, Brother Victor Norfus. I guess I'm used to it, but I'm from uh, District 2. Um, the Black Seminole Reunion is recognition of the individuals that were taken from Florida to Oklahoma uh, during the uh, Second Seminole War. Uh, the actual uh, Black Seminole Reunion includes everyone from the First Seminole War, Second Seminole War, and the final one. Myself, my family were captured in the First Seminole War 
in uh, 1818. Uh, other individuals that came together that were captured and then sent over to Oklahoma, this is our home. And one of the things that people don't understand is that the Chi are the original people of the Gulf, and they settled here. And this is how this all came about, along with the Unity Project, because when they segregated the city, they didn't have to include the Indians because they weren't citizens. And so they would be the first ones coming back through this unity process. So it's all uh, much bigger than uh, just having black Seminoles that were indigenously here and come back to visit their homeland. It's also bringing them back to Boynton Beach because this is where Billy Osceola actually lived and he reconstituted the Miccosukee Nation. So there's a lot of history here that we don't know. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. But thank you, and we will be back. Thank you. You know, I'll mention one thing, Brother Norfus. I know that I made it to the second half of your event, but the first half you did a bus tour of historical sites, which I thought was a phenomenal idea. I think that's good to showcase uh, the city and the county. So thank you for that. The next item of the agenda is our second and final proclamation. Uh, this is for Arbor Day, and I just want to confirm, is Linda Anderson and Patricia Interussi here? Linda, okay, all right, hello. So let me present, let me read this into the record, and I'll come down and present it to you. Whereas Arbor Day started in 1872 is a day set aside to encourage the planting, preservation, and appreciation of trees. And whereas Florida Arbor Day has been observed on the third Friday in January since 1886, and whereas the Boyne Beach Garden Club was formed in 1938 and has been a member of the Florida Federation of Garden Clubs for many years, has celebrated Florida Arbor Day by planting or giving tree away, and whereas the Florida Federation of Garden Clubs is celebrating its 100th anniversary in 2024, and the Boyne Beach Garden Club will celebrate both Florida Arbor Day and the uh, Flor Federation of Garden Clubs uh, birthday on January 19, 2024 by planting uh, lignum vitae. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, lignum vitae. It is the also known as the Tree of Life at 10.30 a.m. at the Boynton Hills Neighborhood Garden. Uh, they will also be giving away wax myrtle tree seedlings. And whereas trees providing countless benefits by improving air quality, providing shade, enhancing our parks and public spaces, reducing stormwater runoff, combating climate change, and providing habitat for wildlife while beautifying our community. And now, therefore, I type and circa mayor of the city of Boynton Beach, Florida, do hereby proclaim the 19th day of January 2024 as Arbor Day. So uh, Linda and Patricia, I'm going to come down. And if you'd like to say a few words to tell us more about your event and what's going to happen and how people can participate, we'd love to hear from you. Yes, we'd love to have um, the community show up at Friday, 1030, at the Boynton Hills Neighborhood Garden. Um, it's been a garden that we are turning into a bird-friendly habitat. Uh, we have the Butterfly Garden, which is right next to the Schoolhouse Museum across the street here. And we thought it would be a nice compliment to have the bird-friendly habitat along with the Butterfly Garden as well. So we'd love to have you come out. I hope it doesn't rain. And it'll just be a short program. And then we'll do the planting of the tree. And, the, and then we'll have a little tour with signage and a handout about the different plants that, are, um, that birds enjoy living among. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you and, and before you leave, did you say your name for the record? Oh, Linda Anderson, president of the Boynton Beach Garden Club. All right, thank you so much. Uh, the next item is just an announcement, um, and it's a, a lengthy announcement, uh, of the Oceanfront Bark, Boynton Beach's dog potty on the beach is being hosted uh, by the Recreation and Parks Department on Saturday, January 20th, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at Oceanfront Park, located at 6415 North Ocean Boulevard. This is the third of four scheduled events being held on the third Saturday of each month through February. This month's theme is Puppy Bowl, 
Dogs and their owners are encouraged to dress up in their favorite uh, football team's jersey uh, to enjoy food trucks, pet-friendly vendors, giveaways, and a photo contest sponsored by Raising Canes. Uh, this event is free for all well-behaved, licensed dogs and their owners. Um, dogs will be allowed off-leash in a designated fence area. Parking at Oceanfront Park is free for the duration of the event for all beach patrons. For more information, visit the city's website, boynton-beach.org. And with that, that concludes all of the announcements. We're going to turn now to public audience. But before we begin, uh, for those of you that may be joining us online or for the first time, I want to remind you uh, that each uh, speaker is limited to three minutes. We have a timer. I'm going to make sure to set that. For those of you online, I'll let you know when you have uh, 30 seconds remaining. Comments must be addressed to the commission as a whole, a body, and not to any individual on the dais or in the audience. Personal attacks are strictly prohibited. And this is a time for you to be heard and for your opinions to be considered in our decision-making process. However, this is not a Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, we will connect with you, with our staff, after the meeting. All right, so let me switch to the timer. And as always, please state your name for the record, and you may begin. David Katz, 67 Midwood Lane, Boynton Beach. It seems that the guardrails provided by the city charter no longer exist for the mayor. In clear violation of the charter, he has embedded himself in personnel matters, and without the consent of a majority vote of the commission, he sought legal advice from outside counsel on personnel matters. Those instances of charter violations are probably the tip of the chaotic iceberg, because where there's smoke, there's fire. The mayor is a great example of the Dunning-Kruger effect. That is when people with limited competence in particular domain overestimate their abilities, and then engage in chaos. He's creating chaos in the city hall by wanting to besmirch honest, well-meaning, hardworking members of city staff, as well as outside city hall, by ruining the reputation of our city. Because of his Don Quixote-type quest to become strong mayor fell flat, the only course left to him is chaos. The mayor has been reaching out to people who live in the city as well as outside the city, pleading his case to no avail, and essentially telling folks he's not going down without a fight. Why not do our city a favor and just resign? Or maybe we should move forward on a recall petition. Everyone should know that until he ran for office four years ago, he had never voted in a city election. The privilege to serve in public office is not about you, it's about the people who will allow you to do it. And you have lost your way, Mayor. Real leaders have a compass, and you've lost all sense of direction. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to speak on any non agenda items, now's the time to approach the podium. We do have two podiums, uh, so please form a line so I know that you are interested in speaking. We will go back and forth between the two sides. So now we will go to the left. All right, so again, we do have a timer. State your name for the record and begin when you're ready. And I can only hear out of one ear, so I'm not sure if I'm talking loud or soft. I think we can hear you. We're, we're, okay. You're good. So state your name for the record and begin. Yes, Nadine Frakes. And first of all, I would like to thank you, Mayor, for your great concern and your understanding when I came to you regarding a complaint that I had about the Boynton Beach Police Department. And I would like to voice a concern to everyone on the commission today. I know I only have three minutes, so I'm gonna try and speed it up a little bit. We spent almost two hours together. My daughter, Michelle, my beloved daughter, Michelle, had MS for 13 years. The first three years, she walked in cement shoes. The next five years, she was in a wheelchair. The last five years of her life, she was totally bedbound, unable to move her legs and her right arm. Sadly, at the end of that, she was placed in hospice in my home. There was no way I wanted her away from me. On the night she died, two police officers walked into my home illegally. The nurse, the hospice nurse had come to pronounce her dead but found out that there was no DNR. My daughter felt she was gonna make it. She was fighting 
very strong. Um, they walked in illegally, and as the paramedics are standing there pronouncing her dead, I heard a noise behind me. I turned around, and here's two police officers in my hallway, and I said, are, are you police? They said, mm-hmm. And I said, well, I mean, they're already in. I said, all right, come in. I didn't know why they were there. I had no idea. So I'm, I'm in shock, even though I knew she was dying. The last three days had been horrible. I don't know why they're there. I assume we had always been big police supporters, attended the police academy several times. There are several great officers that we know of very well, which I'm not going to name here because I'm limited to time and I've got a lot to get in. A sergeant comes in, a Sergeant Haas, um, and he's very polite, very nice. He apologizes for my daughter's loss, and I, but I still don't know why they're there. Next thing I know, he turns and he says to the two officers that walked, I, oh, and I did say to those two women that walked in, I said, you just walked into my home illegally. They just stood there and looked at me. I said to Sergeant Haas, he said to the two officers, you can check her. That was my first understanding that they thought I had done something to my daughter. If I spent all those years taking care of my beloved daughter, there's no way I was going to do anything. Ma'am, your, your time has expired, but I, I thank you for coming here. I want to encourage you to- He lied. Uh, Ma'am, your time all has right. expired, but I want to encourage you to connect with the city manager and the police chief, chief is here this evening. Yeah, so, okay, thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on uh, to the next speaker. We're going to go to the right side of the, po of the room. Let me switch back to the clock. Cindy Falco de Corrado. I'm here tonight because I have a couple of things I'd like to share. I do notice that they're building more water pipes on the west side of Woolbright. Was there campaign funds that were maybe contributed allegedly to you, Mr. Pincerka, and it's from the GL housing that maybe we're selling our water out west? I don't know. Um, thank you for nodding. I also noticed tonight that you're letting people clap. Wow, it changes every time I come in here. So your rules change as you feel led to. Very interesting. The other thing I noticed was the other night I came home and I see nine, 10, about 12 police cars on Boynton Beach Boulevard by I-95. Nine of them parked at the um, Palm Beach Eye Glass place right there, right before I-95. All police cars just stopped there. All the cops were by their cars until I got closer to go over to the bridge to my home. I noticed three police officers in somebody's car. But we had nine police officers. Who pays their salary for standing around doing nothing? Nine. I don't know what the situation was. It was, didn't look like there was an accident. I don't know if it was a raid from someone in the vehicle. But when I saw these nine police cars just sitting there wasting our taxpayers' dollars, it was quite be setting to me because you know our taxes just went up three four hundred dollars per person and we're not getting services for the right reason so they're just kind of hanging out because there's nothing else to do and just standing there it was very very upsetting to me to see this waste of our tax dollars I, I do want to ask that we do a lot better even with the school board I know you heard some good things but I, I was one who stood at the school board when a lot of things were going on and I'm sorry it's not all that glitters is not gold. You need to sit on some of the school board meetings and find out what they're really doing and how you're mistreated as a man or a woman standing up for your children and how they beat you up and throw you out of the school board meetings and don't let you speak. It is horrific. But don't just continue to hear niceties. Go check these things out for yourself. It's your due diligence as commissioners and as a mayor to go and see what's really going on. And also, I am against a strong mayorship for this community. Uh, we do not want it. And yes, there were 300 ballots, I was told by someone who counted the ballots when I was running for mayor that had your name on it, Mr. Pincerka, and they were all illegal. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the other side of the room. And as always, uh, state your name for the record, and you may begin whenever you're ready, sir. This is George Domsky. I'm here to talk about my wife and my stepdaughter, Michelle, that... Uh, a lot of badness went in that night. You heard a few things that Nadine said. Boynton Beach Fire Department was excellent, and uh, they pronounced her dead, 
And uh, like Nadine said, the two officers, females came in without knocking and uh, basically said, uh, we were, were here because we were called, you know, and we were allowed to be in. And uh, I, I said to the, the girls, I said, uh, I had Nadine say, well, according to your policy, you're supposed to knock on the door before you enter anybody's home and stuff. And they just looked at each other and smiled at each other and didn't give it a second thought. Um, and as far as uh, the greatest uh, bad being done is uh, the police officers wanted to take Michelle's body out of the house, even though in Boynton it states there's a law that the, uh, the deceased person can stay inside the house for 24 hours before being uh, brought to a funeral home or for a funeral home pickup. And they were very insistent. They were almost like fighting about, no, she has to go, she has to go. We had one of the uh, lady police officers says, well, I'm gonna stay here until the air conditioning gets down to 32 degrees. I'm not leaving until that happens. And uh, as you know, it's not gonna happen and stuff. And as far as another thing that uh, sergeant finally came in and told the, the uh, two females to 10-8, uh, dismissed, get out of here and stuff. And he said to my wife, um, I'm sorry uh, for such a big fiasco. We hear we're in the wrong and uh, it's a big mistake we had and stuff. You guys do have 24 hours to remove the body. And uh, my wife pulled the body tapes and uh, we had talked to the mayor about it that nowhere in the body tapes is you're able to see that uh, proclamation at all. And also the uh, people that uh, uh, community standards, um, not community standards, but um, um, the police, the police itself, they just uh, don't really do a good job. They just uh, pass it on down the line and the good old boys club is the good old boys club and stuff. And the last thing, uh, Nadine went in to uh, get some more information that they had called. This was back on January the, uh, 9th, and uh, the records were turned in on the 17th, and it took them till January 9th to get it ready. And Nadine asked her over the phone, Renee, uh, she asked Renee that how long does it take to get these records together? And Renee got very upset with uh, the two questions she asked and put the phone down and says, um, this lady is being a ASS whole that, uh, you know, she's asking these questions. So I'm not going to hear of it and stuff, so. All right, sir, your time has up. expired. We're going to turn now to uh, the other side, Mr. Norfus, begin when you're ready. Uh, Brother Victor Norfus, uh, District 2. Uh, what I wanted to speak on was the uh, cemeteries and the lack of a cemetery board and the condition of our cemeteries once they've been taken over by the Parks and Recreation. Um, as you can tell, we're having a problem here. We're burying people. We don't have space. Uh, we're having a problem with actually cleaning the cemetery. That's the one that's called Barton. And we're having problems with the city being willing to move that baseball field and extend the cemetery so that we have spaces because that position where it's at right now is out of date and it needs to be moved. But for some reason, no one even wants to touch that issue. But as far as Barton, I took commissioner, well, <laughs> I'll speak to the mayor. <laughs> um, I took one of the commissioners out to Barton Cemetery. I showed him the condition of it, and he was appalled as well. But the problem that me and my mother, Dr. Martha Meeks Light, have is that there was a cemetery board. She was on it, uh, the Norfus was on it, and we were taking care of the cemeteries. Right now, you have put us in a position where the parks and the recreation is supposed to take care of the cemetery. Who's supposed to recommend changes, additions? There was a board. At one time, there was also a community relations board. Those boards were removed because you said it costs too much money and they never brought back. Those are two of the main boards tonight that you need to reconstitute. Um, the individuals that came up and complained about the police, who are they gonna complain to, the police? If they had a community relations board, we would go out to them and talk with them and find out what the issue is and bring it back to you and as well as get them with the police. But these boards have been taken away from the city and the citizens. We are the ones that are serving on these boards. We should be the ones to recommend to you 
where to do and how to change our cemeteries. We don't have a board and you don't have a clue. And the problem is you will not reconstitute the citizens' ability to assist you in making proper decisions for the city. Also, <clears throat> I'm gonna throw some Indians in there. The uh, Chachi Village that was dedicated uh, this weekend, those individuals come from Ecuador. They were seafaring people. I am gonna contact Peru and Ecuador, trust me. We will make history in Boynton Beach. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna turn it out to the other podium. Please state your name for the record and begin. Absolutely. <clears throat> I am Dr. Piotr Blas, P-I-O-T, Piotr Blas, 113 Tara Lakes West, Boynton Beach, Florida, for many years. I have quite a lot to say. Let me divide it into the positive things and into suggestions. On the positive things, I'll say something obvious. We have a superb library. The library is working better and better every day. And, you know, I went to Harvard. I saw the best libraries. Our library is superb. And if they don't have a book, they'll get it to you from any place in the world. So we have been voted number one library in the state. I think we need to keep it up and maybe become number one in the country. So this is very positive. The other thing which I will consider positive is that our current mayor, Pansierga, Maybe he doesn't remember, but I was the young man who got him into politics and supported him, and I'm still proud of him. I think these attacks that I hear are not kosher. Something is wrong. The guy is doing a good job, and suddenly people are jumping him. I don't even know over what. Strong mayor, not strong mayor. Now, this is friendly competition. I am running for mayor, but I will debate you, not attack you and one of us will emerge a strong or weak mayor. So this was not cool. And now I have to say something very positive. I was so proud to have a Seminole Indian from Oklahoma come to us. If you guys know American history, the Trail of Tears was like a Holocaust. Many, many people died you know, they were forcibly moved. And so I, since I'm very Jewish, I'm thinking to create a monument. One side will be the Holocaust and the other side will be the Trail of Tears. So let's welcome them. The uh, historian of the Seminole tribe, Billy Jones, is my student. He is the only PhD in the tribe. And he told me that the last Seminole war never ended but we're not fighting really. But you understand they never surrendered, okay? Did you, did you know that? Anyway, that's the truth. Um, I, I say something a little bit deep. To the Indians from the tip of Alaska to the bottom of Chile and the Caribbean, the Taino people, it used to all be one country. But the white men in their infinite wisdom or stupidity divided it into 50 countries. Now we have immigration problem from hell. So maybe we should stop and think, maybe we can learn from these native people. And I intend to learn from them. And it would be so wonderful, it is so wonderful that they're coming to Boynton. And I just found out that one of the chiefs of the Seminoles is from this. So this is very positive and let's encourage it. May I, I have only Thank one. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> There's always I, another meeting, so. No, 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 I, I only, uh, Mayor, I only have 10 seconds. Quickly, quickly do ten, it. Ten, ten seconds. And the next Everybody, person, listen, if you'd like ten, to move to the ten, podium. Ten seconds. Quickly do it, we, sir. Boynton is famous for kinetic sculpture with sound. Yes. Our sculpture has been broken right. for six months. Thank Fix you. Fix it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next person, state your name for the record, and you may begin. Sir Gabriel, I'm staying in 121 Southwest Third Court. This is the thing I want to quote the thing from the Bible. Um, last time when I was being uh, talking about the uh, Father in Heaven, you stopped me from doing. But I think this quotation from Matthew 5, you allow me to quote it? Ma'am, uh, the, the comments have to be about city business. Yeah. If you could it'll connect be, it to city business. It will be business. by thir be 30, three, three minutes as per. Please minute. connect it to city business, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, sir. Blessed are poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those which hunger for thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If we fast this versus there won't be much problem in our life. I want to follow this quotation. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your kind words. All right. I see no one else in the room. Uh, IT, let's go to those online. Do we have anybody? I see a wave. Is that a yes? No, that was a no. All right. That means public audience is now closed. Uh, we have nothing under administrative, so let's move on to ag consent agenda. Are there any items under con consent agenda that my colleagues would like to pull? Let's begin on my right. Commissioner Cruz, anything here? Yes, I'd like to pull item 6J. 6J, let's find that, 6J. Okay. This is the local agency program agreement. All right, was there anything else? No, that's it. All right, let's turn to Vice Mayor. Um, 6L and 6E. 6L and 6E. L and E. Okay. And let's turn to Commissioner Hay. Any items you'd like to pull? No, good. No requests. Commissioner uh, Kelly. No, thank you. All right. With that, let's first have a motion to approve the remainder of consent agenda. No move. Second. I heard a motion from Vice Mayor first, and I heard a second from uh, Commissioner Hay. All those in favor of approving the remainder of consent agenda, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Let's address these pulled items in the order that we see them in the agenda, which would be 6E first. Uh, this is proposed resolution number R23-005, approve and authorize a city manager uh, to sign the first amendment to the interlocal agreement between the city of Boyne Beach and the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office providing 111,000 in additional funds to PBSO for the state assistance for fentanyl eradication program in Florida to cover operational cost of the investigative operation. City Manager, uh, I want to turn to you, and um, I don't know if the Chief wants to chime in as well, but let's begin with you, City Manager Duggar. Yeah, this is uh, money that we were receiving from the state. I know uh, those of you who are aware, we just had a uh, large um, multi-agency operation that I want to say removed probably about 44 pounds of uh, fentanyl off the uh, streets of Boynton Beach. Um, is the chief of police back there? He's outside with them. Witty. He might be uh, speaking He's to the person. Oh, is he? Is all of them there? I know there's uh, I just want to give him a chance to. Yeah. Maybe we can come back to it. Yeah, we can do that. Others. Okay. All right. Um, do you want to ask um, any questions? No, I just meantime? wanted I just wanted to pull that because I think it's important to note that what the, the big accomplishments that we can do between working with the state agencies, looking at grant funding, what can be done, <clears throat> you know, where this fentanyl was taken off the street, you know, 44, 44 pounds or, you know, however many kilos, you know, a few blocks from a, from a school is a huge deal. And uh, I just really wanted to give kudos, you know, to both the, the city staff are working with the police department in the grant processing. And then of course, you know, you know, our, our brave men and women for uh, putting their lives at, at risk to uh, make this a, a cleaner and safer community. And so um, I just, you know, just want to give the kudos out there and, you know, just make it known how important it is, you know, for us to chase and proceed these type of grants because this is the result, you know, saving, you know, dozens, thousands, really thousands of lives you know, from um, this stuff that's killing our, you know, our kids and our youth on the street. Yeah, this is uh, Chief Jack Dale. He's a uh, very distinguished career with uh, BSO. He's been with the uh, department for probably about two years. He's uh, the assistant chief over uh, support services with the Detective Bureau and Investigation Services. So just uh, they let you uh, speak a little bit about the uh, grant that we got for the um, state assistance program with the fentanyl education. Yeah, we um, thank you for... Um the kudos, the uh, members of the investigative division did uh, exceptional work. It was a extended case. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without a grant from uh, FDLE. Um, and the reason that we, we got this grant was because <clears throat> Boynton Beach 
um, has a higher number of uh, fentanyl overdose deaths. And uh, they were able to fund uh, our investigation and we were able to, to put forth some meaningful results. I have them uh, here. It was an 18 month investigation. Um, they did 11 search warrants. There were 23 uh, kilograms of cocaine seized, um, 127 grams of fentanyl, 34 grams of, of amphetamine, uh, over $100,000 seized, nine vehicles, 23 firearms, uh, 22 arrests, and uh, we have more charges that are forthcoming. So um, it was uh, completed in conjunction with the Palm Beach uh, Sheriff's Office, but the majority of the targets were right here in Boynton. Um, so we would expect that this would have a, a, a profound impact. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, any other questions or comments from my colleagues on this item? If not, may have a motion to approve item 6E. So move. Second. We have a motion. I heard a second from Commissioner Kelly. All those in favor of approving item 6E say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the next pulled item on the consent agenda was item J, proposed resolution number R24-010, approve and authorize a city manager to sign the local agency program agreement, accept the LAP agreement, and execute all documents associated with the LAP agreement subject to the approval of the city attorney for the Southeast First Street Complete Streets Improvement Project. Thank you. May, Mayor, I actually, <clears throat> I would like to table this item. I am waiting for the um, TPA executive director to get back to me. Um, I am the representative of Boyden for transportation in the Palm Beach Agency, and I'm waiting to see if we can potentially get more funding for this, so that's why I wanted to table. All right. Thank you. Motion to table. Okay, is there a second, second. to vote? We heard a second. Uh, I think the second came from Commissioner Kelly. All those in favor of tabling this item? And can we be more specific on that? I assume to the next meeting? Yes, all right, just making sure the motion we, is clear. We, we, um, um, Mark, now before we, I call the final vote, I know we had a motion and a second. I know staff wants to add, uh, did you want to add a little bit? Yeah, yeah so go this ahead. is Mosey with engineering. Um, this item, we need it to be on this agenda for the FDOT agreement we have. We have to get the agreement back to DOT per the requirements by the 22nd of January. If this item is tabled, it's a possibility that this grant will be forfeited. Oh, all right. Well, I'm glad oh. you said something, sir. Yeah. That is important to know. Um, Should so I pull my motion? Then, never mind then. Yes. Um, we'll rescind my motion. If you can just, I, would, I think it's clear to all if you say that you're rescinding your motion. Okay, rescinding my motion. Okay. We still want additional funding. We can always come back and look at the specific subject, but for the DOT aspect, this is why. Uh, and um, above that as well, per the lab agreement, the DOT is not allowed to give more than $1.5 million per grant per project. So if we did want additional funding through a grant, it would have to be through a different grant funding source. All right. Thank you. I guess motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second, but this is to approve the item. <laughs> yes, uh, all those in favor of the motion to approve item uh, 6J, say aye. 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 Aye, all those opposed say no. All right, motion passes, uh, 6J is passed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we are moving on to L, 6L, proposed resolution number R24-012, approve and authorize the use of $236,500 of the city's state housing initiatives and partnership ship program funds towards the rehabilita rehabilitation of the property located at 2385 Southwest 13th Way, Boynton Beach, Florida, 33426, and authorize the mayor to sign a sub-recipient agreement with Habitat for Humanity of Greater Palm Beach County, Inc. to complete the rehabilitation of the property. All right, so uh, now that the item is pulled, uh, let let's begin with you, sir. All right. Um, Mayor and Vice Mayor Commissioner, this is RJ Ramirez. I'm the uh, Community Improvement Manager for the city. And as the Major just read, this uh, item is to uh, ask an authorization from City Commission to utilize $236,500 to rehabilitate a property uh, belonging to a low-income uh, uh, veteran, a disabled veteran uh, here in Boynton Beach. Uh, the reason I ask an authorization is because uh, I actually have a presentation if you guys want to see it. But uh, in a nutshell, so uh, the um, 
the local housing assistance plan through the CHIP program, what they call it, the State Housing Initiative uh, in Partnership Program, allow up to $95,000 for low-income individuals uh, for to real estate properties. Because we're going over the amount uh, also to comply with uh, for the monitoring uh, and asking authorization for City Commission to utilize these funds toward the rehabilitation of this property. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor, you had pull this item if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I just wanted to pull it. I reviewed this with staff earlier today and I think it's a good story to tell. You know, this is a disabled veteran who served our country and I see Mr. Hart there. I've heard uh, he's, he's been a big component of this. And so I just want to commend you and you, RJ, you know, for uh, thinking about those who served and making this happen. And um, I think this is an individual in, in your district, Commissioner Cruz, and, you know, um, you know, senior and disabled, you know, veteran. It's a lot, lot of lot of boxes checked, which makes it difficult for this individual. And so, when you can make an impact um, this important into someone's life, I think it's something that we should celebrate. Um, you know, because we we hear a lot of negativity, and th I think it's important to illuminate the positive impacts that we do here at the city of Boynton Beach. Thank you, sir. So thank you for what you yeah, do. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, uh, I have a team behind this project, uh, Habitat for Humanity, a community standard, uh, Jim from uh, the HOA, and a group of people, Home Depot and other partners that have come together to put this project and to complete this project. And this project is priority for the city to be able to get this uh, homeless disabled veteran back to his home. So Habitat for Humanity has worked very hard with uh, some partners uh, in the community to be able to bring this uh, project to a very low cost and uh, with some donations, some volunteer work, uh, be able to get Mr. Harlan back to his house. Yeah, I think it's also important to recognize that uh, Commissioner Cruz has worked tirelessly behind the scenes for a very, very long for time sure. to make sure this individual got the help that he, uh, he needed. So I think she needs to be recognized for that. Uh, cool. Absolutely, definitely. We commend Good you. Good job, Commissioner. We commend you, Commissioner. Taking care of our veterans. It's important. A lot of people forget about them. So thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Vice. Guys, and I, I do want to thank staff. Um, RJ, you've done a fantastic job, and you know, as you mentioned, um, Habitat for Humanity, and our city manager also for for supporting that initiative. Thank you. Uh, there's something to be said about persistence, and because you kept pushing for this, uh, this person's life will be dramatically changed. So thank you. Um, was there anything else for my colleagues to be added, Commissioner Kelly? Just I, when I was up in Palm Beach County days, I had an opportunity to speak to um, Jennifer from Habitat, and they're um, super excited to be a part of this. And um, there is, you know, there have been a lot of donations, and there's been a lot of people that have jumped in. But even she was even saying there's even still more that they want to do to make sure that not only when the repairs are done, but he has a fully functioning and useful house. And so even so, she even was talking to me about you know, what we can do even further to make sure that um, that not only is the home livable, but that he can enjoy, you know, enjoy it. So so the ask is not done, right? And, um, and so we'll, I know that Habitat and the city will be looking for community partners to help, uh, you know, to make this home um, as best as it can be for him. So thank you. All right, thank you. With that, I'm gonna ask for a motion to approve item 6L. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Cruz, a second from Vice Mayor Turkin. All those in favor of approving item 6L say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes unanimously. And if I'm not mistaken, that is all of the pulled consent agenda items. Is that correct? Did I miss anybody? Can I give a quick recognition? Sure. Um, Jim Sissick is in the audience. He's been a, a great... Um, part of this initiative and I just want to thank him for everything he's done. I know he's been um, communicating often with our staff to make sure that this happens so I just wanted to thank um, him in addition to our staff and just give a round of applause for always doing community work. Just one last Vice thing. Just, just because Commissioner Kelly mentioned about additional community support I think, it, I think you know as a city we we uh, granted some funds to Wounded Veterans Relief Fund, and this is something that specialize in. So I think that's an avenue um, as well. So just for city staff to help kind of bridge that gap. I already did research on that, and um, there's, there's a, I'm, I don't know if I can talk about that. Um, kind of like, yeah. What was the, yeah. was it disability percentage? It, yeah, it's a percentage of disability, which is not met, and it has to be on duty, which was not 
that's that's okay. the reason why. Thank you. Make it All right, thank you. Um, the next portion of the agenda is consent bids and purchases over $100,000. Are there any items that my colleagues would like to pull? Commissioner Kelly, any requests? No, thank you. Commissioner Hay? No. Vice Mayor? Uh, Commissioner Cruz? No. With that, may have a motion to approve the entirety of consent so bids? Second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Cruz, a second from Commissioner Kelly to approve the entirety of consent bids and purchases. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously, and all those items have now been approved. We're now moving on to public hearing, and Council, I'm going to turn to you to begin the process. I know we have to make our disclosures at this point. Does everybody have their little reminder sheet? All right, Council, do you want to just take us through the process briefly? You could, just with regard to items A, B, and C, if you can disclose whether you've had any ex parte declarations or disclosures as to each item and then make them part of the record. Yes. Now, I do not remember everyone's name. They are in the audience, um, but they will state their names uh, for sure in a moment. Um, I do have uh, the agenda, so I know some of their names are here, but I, I will include that later in my disclosures. But let's go around the dais. Any, let's begin with you, Commissioner Cruz. As to this matter, I have not had ex parte communications. I have not received written communications. I have not conducted an investigation. I have not made a site visit. I have not received expert opinions. I request that these disclosures and all written communications be made part of the record. Is that for items A, B, and C? Correct. Okay, thank you. All right, for items uh, 8, 8A, 8, 8B, 8C, as to this matter, I have had uh, ex parte communications with Amy Carlson, Andrew Maxey, and Matthew Barnes from the Pulte Group. I had received a written communication uh, via email, uh, have not conducted an investigation, have not made a site visit, and um, I don't know if I really received any expert opinion. It was more so just, okay, thanks. Uh, have not received any expert opinion. I request that these disclosures and all written communications be made part of the record. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Commissioner Hay? Uh, as of this matter, A, B, and C, I have not had ex parte communication, received written communication, uh, conducted an investigation, made a site visit, received expert opinion. I request that these disclosures and written communication be made part of the record. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. Um, with regard to 8A, B, and C, as to this matter, I have not had ex parte communications, received written communications, conducted an investigation, nor have I made a site visit, nor have I received expert opinions. I request that these disclosures and all written communications be made part of the record. Thank you. Uh, as for myself, as to this matter, items 8, B, and C, I have had ex parte communications with uh, I believe it's pronounced Ame, Ame Carlson, on Andrew Maxey, Matthew Barnes. Um, I have received written communications from Mr. Andrew Maxey, but I have not conducted a site investigation. Excuse me, I have not conducted an investigation. I have not made a site visit, and I have not received expert opinions. I request that these disclosures and all written communications be made part of the record. All right, thank you. And um, so let's turn to the city clerk for uh, reading of the item. Anyone that is here to speak on items uh, eight, swearing in. A, oh, B, yeah. and C, please stand up and raise your right hand. Do you swear to affirm that the evidence you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. May I have a seat? Proposed ordinance number 24-001, first reading an ordinance of the city of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending ordinance 02-013 to rezone a parcel of land described herein and commonly referred to as a Pulte Cottage District from a single and two family residential R2 to in full planned unit development, IPUD, providing for a conflict, variability, and an effective date. All right, thank you. Council? Is there anything else to be added? 
No. Oh, okay. You can proceed. Okay. So uh, with that, I believe we have representatives. Let's let's please approach the podium. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. For the record, Matthew Barnes, Senior Project Manager with WGI, here on behalf of the applicant, Pulte Homes. Um, with me here in the audience tonight is Tyler Tornese, Planner with WGI, uh, Ryan Wheeler, the Vice President of Caulfield and Wheeler, who's the Civil Engineer for the project, is here. And from Pulte Homes, we have um, Ame Carlson, Director of Land Planning and Entitlements, and Andrew Maxey. Vice President of Land Acquisitions. And, and sir, let me, let me ask you, just pause for one moment. And Council, I just want to be clear to the public and to my colleagues, we are addressing all three items uh, simultaneously, or would you rather do this piecemeal? I'm com I, I believe that they should be addressed separately, but because they do involve one project and kind of go together, if the applicant can choose to address them all at one time. So what we'll do is we'll hear a presentation that combines all items, but we'll do the voting separately. Does that make sense? All right. Yes. Sounds good. Just to make sure we're absolutely clear. Yeah, my presentation covers all, okay. all three applications. Good, good, good. Yep. Thanks. And I'll try to be as brief. Um, to... I'm sorry. Then, then I would just like to have the clerk read the other two uh, proposals for the record before your presentations. My apologies. All right. If you could read uh, B and C. Thank you. Oh, Mike. Approve a request for a variance ZCVL-2023.06.4139 from part, part three, chapter four, article 13, section two, requires sustainable development standards, electric change, charging stations requirement for the Pulte Cottage District generally located between Northeast 5th Avenue and Northeast 4th Avenue and between Seacrest Boulevard and Northeast 1st Street. Okay, 8C, approve a request for the new master plan and new site plan, NMP, NWSP 2023.06.4139 for the Pulte Cottage District for 19 single family units and 22 townhome units property generally located between Northeast 5th Avenue and Northeast 4th Avenue and between Seacrest Boulevard and Northeast 1st Street. All right, thank All right, you. Thank you. Let's see if the remote here works. This is the way you control the PowerPoint. Oh, there we go, okay. Uh, the property that's actually owned by the CRA. So in, in some sense, you guys are co-applicants here tonight. So this is an exciting project. I'm excited to bring it forward to you. Um, it's not too far from here. It's just north of the intersection of Boynton Beach Boulevard and Seacrest um, uh, Boulevard on uh, about 750 feet north of there. Uh, the surrounding uses, it is mostly single family. Uh, there's some duplexes around. Um, there's some multifamily a couple blocks to the north, and there's actually a daycare slash a preschool uh, just to the northwest of the, of the property. Um, so... As the clerk just read into the record, you know, we're here for a rezoning. Uh, it's because we're doing an infill, it, it almost has to be an IPUD zoning district. That's the appropriate zoning district to do for this kind of a project. Um, we're also doing the master plan and the site plan. It's 41 uh, total units, uh, 19 single family homes, and 22 townhomes. All of them are going to be for sale in workforce housing. Again, the variance application is just to uh, not provide an electrical vehicle charging station, which is a, one of the base requirements of the sustainability code. We are meeting, I'd like to point out, we are meeting the entirety of the rest of the sustainability code. It's just this, the charging stations didn't, um, uh, didn't make sense for this particular project. Um, again, this will allow the 100% affordable workforce housing project. The, um, the townhome units are gonna be sold into the low income category and the single family homes will be sold into the moderate one income category through the Palm Beach County Workforce Housing Program. So a little bit about Pulte Homes. Um, they've been a, an active builder in Palm Beach County for over 50 years through both their Pulte Homes brands and their DeVosta brand. Um, they have a tradition of a commitment to build incredible places where people can live their dreams, whether that's at home, at work, or in the community. Um, a smattering of some recent projects include the Fields, which is uh, more than 1,000 units in the western part of the Lake Worth area, Avondale at Avenir, which is um, close to 400 single-family homes 
in, in Avenir, which is the premier master plan community up in Palm Beach Gardens. Uh, the Enclave, <coughs> excuse me, the Enclave at Sherwood Park, which is a, a smaller community, a boutique community of 79 homes in, in Delray Beach. Greyhawk Landing, 131 homes in Western Palm Beach County. And uh, Everton, 210 townhomes in Central Palm Beach County. But Pulte Homes also has a, a strong history and a lot of projects with affordable housing and workforce housing. Uh, I'll spotlight a few of those here for you. In, in Delray Beach, they, you know, Pulte Homes built uh, Carver Square, which was 20 single family homes that ranged in, in, in a size and style there. It was also like, like this project, it was a partnership with the Delray Beach uh, CRA. Um, the, the, the houses there were sold into the low, moderate one, moderate two, and middle income categories. Um, uh, they were offered for sale in the spring of 2022. They were held to their 2020 prices, and they, all the units were closed by the end of last year. Uh, two other projects to highlight real quick, there were workforce housing as well. Um, another partnership with the City of West Palm Beach Housing Authority, uh, Mary Place. That was a mixture of uh, townhomes and single family homes, 34 towns and two singles. Um, also low and moderate one income categories, and again, all the units there have been sold. And then a smaller sort of a, almost a boutique project um, in Delray Beach called We Are Home. Uh, it's three single family homes. Um, it was a unique program in that um, it, it, it was building generational wealth for the families that were involved because the, the lots were remained owned by the families. Um, they were sold into the, to the low and moderate one income categories and, and all three of them have been sold. Uh, the timeline of this project stretches back uh, quite a ways, actually. It goes all the way back to 2007 when the CRA started purchasing lots in, in this project site. Um, the assembly continued up through 2021, um, but then in 2016, the CRA actually identified this site in their CRA plan as a priority site for affordable housing. Uh, and then in 2022, uh, the CRA received the letter of intent from Pulte, which be began the negotiation process for the purchase and development of the site for 100% affordable workforce housing. And then in on January 10th, 2023, almost exactly a year ago, um, the CRA board approved the purchase agreement with Pulte. And then this past June of uh, June 7th, 2023, is when we first submitted the site plan and the civil plans and architectural plans, landscape plans, et cetera. And since June, we've been working diligently with your city staff to perfect those plans and bring it forward to you tonight for the approval of the rezoning and site plan. Um, you can see the site on the left side is what it looked like in 20, in uh, 2005. Um, you know, it was, even then, there were a lot of uh, vacant pieces of land. Uh, as you can see, obviously, in 2022, as sites have been acquired, some of the homes have been demolished, so it's, it's, um, you know, it's ready to go. Um, the, the IPUD is, it's, like I said, it's the appropriate zoning district for this kind of infill uh, project. Um, there's four standards in the, in the IPUD zoning. Uh, it's supposed to be an infill redevelopment of vacant land, so that's obviously in, uh, checks the box here. Project must be less than five acres. We are 4.6 acres. Uh, the project must be an enhancement to the local area and the city in general. I think you'll see after the presentation that that, that that box is being checked as well, and that it's compatible with the character and the form of the surrounding neighborhood. And I'll, I'll speak to that in just a minute. The land use, we're not changing the land use. So the, the future land use designation is uh, medium residential, which allows up to 11 units per acre. We're not asking to change that. We're actually coming in below that. Um, so that's not part of the request. Density-wise, we are at 8.85 units per acre. Of course, that's kind of mixed across the site. There's single-family homes and townhomes, uh, but when you add up all the units and divide it by the number of acres, it's 8.85. That's actually very compatible with what's around us. Um, you know, you can see that um, on, the, particularly on the on the to the east of us, where there's a mix of single-family homes and duplexes, um, some of that density is as high as nine units an acre. Some of the more single-family homes to our south are around four and a half units an acre. So we're in that range of the neighborhood. I'm not gonna pretend to read all these words on, this, on the screen here, but your code has eight different rezoning, you know, criteria or compliance check marks that you're supposed to hit. Suffice it to say, we submitted written materials in the application. Uh, your staff has reviewed them um, and found that we meet all the rezoning compliance uh, uh, criteria. 
Same thing for the variance. There's six criteria for the variance. Um, again, that's just for the not providing the charging station. It's just providing, it would be a charging station that would have been, and you'll see in a minute when I get to the site plan, it's a charging station that would have been in the guest parking spaces near the pocket park of the project, which uh, didn't think was an appropriate um, thing to have. Also, it's a burden, a cost burden on the HOA for an affordable housing project going forward on an, on, on an annual basis. So here's the site plan that we submitted to the city in June. It looks a lot like what you're gonna see in, in a minute, but there are just a few changes that I'll highlight. When we made our first, uh, when we got our first set of comments back from the city and we, we resubmitted, we increased the setback on the north side from five to 10 feet in order to provide the appropriate sized utility easement. Um, we provided safe site triangles at all the uh, driveway intersections with the roads to show that you know none of them were gonna create any issue. Then we made a second resubmittal, and uh, part of that was we increased the number of parking spaces at the pocket park from two to four. We um, changed the orientation of some of the homes. They, they were, if I go back a slide, um, you can see those homes at the southeast corner were facing north, uh, nor uh, sorry, no, First Avenue, and then we flipped them to be oriented towards Fourth Street. Um, that kind of keeps in character with the surrounding neighborhoods, so that was um, one change we made. And then we also added, we, all, we had a type two landscape buffer to the west of the townhomes. We added a type one landscape buffer to the north and west of those single family homes that abut the other property that's not part of, that's on the block but not part of the project. And then our final resubmittal, our third one, we, we added an ADA accessible parking space at the pocket park and then we added uh, shaded cover to the uh, bike rack that is in the pocket park. So this is the final site plan. This is the, um, you know, the colored version that you can see that, you know, you can see where all the green space is. Um, there's a dry detention, that darker green area that you see on the right-hand side, that is a dry detention area. That's where our drainage is being handled. And I'll go through some of the features of the site as well. Um, there's almost, a, even for a small property of 4.6 acre property, there's almost a half a mile of sidewalks um, in and around the, the project, a, a sidewalk that continues the pattern of the public sidewalk along all the streets. And then we're, as you can see, we're, we're building, um, you know, a new 40 foot wide private right of way um, north south through the property that um, there'll be sidewalks on both sides of the street. And then there's a sidewalk that goes through the pocket park. The pocket park is, on the right side of that street where you see sort of the, the teal covered square, I mean, that's a, that's a covered pavilion that's in the pocket park. There's a mail kiosk, bike, uh, bike racks, and then two benches that overlook the um, dry detention area. Um, just wanted to point out that all the single family homes are kind of on the perimeter of the, the property, right? They face outward connecting to the street, whereas the townhomes face inward um, onto the private street, uh, the new north-south private street. Um, again, I mentioned before, there's a type two urban landscape buffer to the west of those townhomes to buffer us from the single family, existing single family home to our west. So in that buffer, there's a six foot tall uh, masonry wall and then uh, trees, 14 foot tall trees at the time of planting, which will grow larger, but um, every 30 feet on center. And then as that buffer goes south and hits the single family homes, it turns into what your code calls a type one urban landscape buffer, which is similar. Um, uh, trees every 30 feet on center, and then there's even more trees on the west side of that home that faces Seacrest, recognizing that Seacrest is a busier street than all the other side streets. Um, we do have some signature Vera Wood trees at the north and south entrances to the project on that private street. Um, shade producing trees are being provided in the front and backyards of, of all the single family homes. And then per your sustainability code, there's a butterfly attracting plant species in the dry detention area. So that'll be a nice amenity for the whole community, especially since the pocket park has benches and a, and a pavilion that basically overlook the dry detention area. Um, again, the street is, it's a 40 foot wide right of way. It's basically um, two, uh, I think 10 foot travel lanes, north and south. Um, parking, we have plenty of parking. Every single family home has a two car garage and a two car driveway. Um, the end units of every townhome building also have a two car garage and a two car driveway and the interior units for the townhomes have a one car garage, but a two car driveway. So every, every unit has enough parking 
um, for their own use as well as guests. And there's four, like I said, there's four guest parking spaces at the pocket park. Um, the sizes of the units, the, the, uh, the townhomes will range from 1,877 square feet to um, 1,986 square feet. I mentioned the garages, they are, all the townhomes are um, three bedrooms and two and a half baths. And then the single family homes, there's actually three different models and I'll show you the, the architectural elevations of all these in just a minute. The, the Hamden model is a two story model and that's um, 3,447 square feet. Um, that's a three bedroom, two and a half bath model. And then the Chapman and Browning models are both single stories. You know, one of them's 2,267 square feet, the other one's 2,028. Those are all three bedroom, two bath uh, models. And so here's, there's two different color schemes to the townhomes, but this is one of the t color schemes. And then there's the other one that kind of, um, you know, flips the colors a little bit. Um, then this is that Hamden model I was talking about, the two-story. Um, this is the Browning model. And then this is the Chapman model. So I think, um, like I mentioned before, that you know, you have the staff report in your packet. The staff, we've worked diligently with staff since, since we first submitted this in June. Um, staff supports all of the requests, so um, we don't have any, any issues there. And that, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's hear from staff first before we entertain questions. And also, of course, from the public. All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Andrew Meyer, Senior Planner, and I'll be presenting the Pulte Cottage District requests. Tonight's request includes a rezoning from R2 to IPUD, a new master and site plan for 16 single family units and 22 townhome units, and a variance from the sustainable development standards requirement for electric charging stations. The 4.63 acre site is generally located between Northeast 5th Avenue and Northeast 4th Avenue and between Seacrest Boulevard and Northeast 1st Street. The rezoning request is from single and two family residential to infill planned unit development. Uh, no changes to the future land use are proposed as part of this request. Uh, the site consists of 20 vacant parcels and one former alleyway, which was abandoned in 2018 through Ordinance 18-028. The site consists of nearly the entire block with the exception of two parcels along Seacrest Boulevard, which are not included as part of this request. Shown here is the master plan for the proposal. Uh, the master plan includes 19 single family homes and 22 townhomes. The single family homes front, the most, front most of the site's perimeter while four townhome buildings front a new right-of-way proposed through the site. The project's required open space will be accessible from both Northeast Fifth Avenue and the new right-of-way. A dry detention area is located towards the middle of the site. Shown here is the proposal site plan. The proposed single-family homes range in size from uh, 1,447 to 1,822 square feet. And the proposed townhomes range from about 1547 to 1555 square feet. All single family and townhome units will contain three bedrooms and all units will have parking that meet the city's parking standard. Four guest parking spaces, a covered bicycle rack and mail kiosk have been provided next to the proposed new right of way. Two single family homes and one townhome building will be constructed first at the northeast corner of the new right of way and northeast 4th Avenue and will serve as model homes as the rest of the site, as the rest of the site is constructed. Shown here is the proposed landscape plan. Uh, the plan includes a landscape buffer along the west side of the site to buffer the site from existing uses along Seacrest Boulevard. Uh, shown here are renderings of the three proposed models of the single family homes. And shown here is a rendering of one of the proposed townhomes. 
the remainder of the townhomes will have a, the same architecture and will be of similar colors. The applicant is seeking a variance from the sustainable development standards requirement of electric charging stations. This PUD is required to adhere to the sustainable development standards, which include the provision of an electric charging station for electric vehicles. The workforce housing ordinance allows applications to apply for a waiver if compliance with a standard would preclude the construction of workforce housing units. Uh, the applicant states that the construction of electric charging stations would preclude the construction of workforce housing and as such has applied for this variance request according to the waiver provision of the workforce housing code section. Staff has reviewed the request and finds that it generally satisfies the variance review criteria of the LDRs. All right. Uh, to summarize, uh, after reviewing the requests against the land development regulations, staff recommends the approval of the rezoning, the new master plan and site plan subject to the conditions of approval, and the variance request. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Staff is available for any questions you may have. All right, thank you. Uh, we will have time for questions, but let's go to the public first so we hear everything. Uh, let us now turn to public audience specifically on these three items, on the rezoning, the, the site plan, as well as the variance request. If you would like to speak on these items, now is the time to approach the podium. Uh, seeing no one approaching the podium, is there anybody online? That is a no. With that, public audience is now closed. I'll turn back now to the applicant, uh, as well as staff, if there's anything you want to uh, follow up with, add, uh, amend. I just want to make sure you have an opportunity to to address all those items. Yeah, nothing else to add. Here, nothing else? Here for your question. Okay. Yeah. I, I take it staff has nothing else to add? Just going through the steps, guys. Um, so I'll turn now to my colleagues on the dais if they have any questions or comments for either staff or for the applicant. So if staff could just be ready at the podium. I'm going to begin, or was I left? Let's begin my left, Commissioner Kelly. Was I, was, was I left before? No, you're fine. I, okay. really, I really don't have um, that many questions. I, um, I, and I, because the, and I, I get and support and understand the electric charging stations, um, I mean, I would assume that the garages will be equipped with some, you know, enough power should one of the residents have, you know, an electric car and they need to have, that ability that that's something that would be available to them as so homeowners. The, the garages will be just be equipped like any normal garage, uh, just with your standard right. 120 volt and then not not a you know not what you would call a level two charger thing. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. But but yeah you can still plug in like anyone can plug in to a regular outlet. Right. It's not a fast charger but it charges. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I just wanted to make sure. I mean, there's residents and I mean, there are single family homes. So mm -hmm. that kind of, I think, um, cures the any concern with the ability to be able to charge their vehicles. Mm -hmm. So um, that, and then I just I had it was there. It says a new major site plan. Was there some sort of former that this is new or that's just it's the master site plan. The new major site plan, that's the application type. So there there wasn't a prior Got site it. plan. Okay. It's just the, uh, it, as opposed to a site plan modification, which would come in if there was a previously approved site plan. Got it. Just wanted to make sure I was reading that right. Okay. No, I'm good. I don't have any questions. Or Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Hay, anything from you? I really, well, I do have a concern. Uh, going back to the, uh, the electric charging station, with the trend uh, in this modern day of going in that direction, I just wondered why that uh, you recommending the approval of eliminating those, right? And I just, just, can you give me a little more background as to your position so I can be uh, on your side, <laughs> yeah, um, we we do um, we do require this of of these types of projects. Um, another goal of the city generally is to provide a, um, a, a 
diverse choice of housing. Um, and so within our code, in the workforce housing portion of the code, there is a provision that says if a requirement would preclude the construction of any affordable housing or workforce housing, um, that a waiver could be sought for that. Um, nor, we don't have specifically a waiver process, um, which is part of the reason we, we brought it through as a variance, um, just so that it could go in front of this body tonight and, and the following uh, meeting in order to, um, to just to be, you know, for full transparency. Um, since that waiver portion is part of the code and it is, um, it is made available to those that uh, construct that type of housing, um, we did recommend approval just because um, they, they are constructing that type of housing and that they are just seeking this waiver in order to, to meet that. If I could add just one more thing. I think it's also an important distinguishing factor between this project and any other project that would require this is that this is a combination of multifamily and single family. If you were building any other single family development that isn't a plain unit development, you wouldn't be required to put in the EV stations because each owner would have the ability to put in their own EV charging station if they wanted to or if they had an EV car. So in that sense, this is a little bit unique that it is a blend of typologies that wouldn't necessarily require it otherwise. It is based on their zoning and their use, which the requirement applies. So that's one some of the distinguishing factors that led staff to approving this request. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, but where you had the, uh, for the bicycles and all that, that little small area there, if they wanted to, you, you could put one there later on. You could. I, what we've seen is some of the complications when um, it's HOA run. It, it's either, who, who does it service? Because each one of the homeowners would probably opt to use their own if they had one, or you're Electric. servicing people who don't live in the community, or they would have to invest in some sort of technology and give a code. Right. And then people are fighting over that one space. So there are some layers to that that doesn't necessarily work well in this situation, but yes, it is possible. Uh, and we have seen some developments opt to put them in their guest spaces or in some of their required parking that isn't being used for assigned parking. So it, it has been done. Um, since this is a for sale product, staff was a little bit more comfortable in recommending approval. Thank you for that explanation. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you, Commissioner Hay, and thank you to staff's response. Let's turn to Vice Mayor. Um, I'll, I'll uh, pass on my comments now. Okay. I'll wait after Commissioner Cruz. Please. Okay, Commissioner Cruz. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my concern was the same thing with the vehicle charging stations. I personally have an electric vehicle, and a lot of times I drive around and I try to find, you know, the, the ones that the city provides. Um, my home, thankfully, does have a garage. But as you mentioned, it is the 120, um, so it takes quite a while to charge. Um, I've seen buildings such as 500 Ocean where people are fighting each other for electric vehicle spaces. So it is a legitimate concern. Um, we also know that several vehicle manufacturers have started to say that they're going fully electric or um, going hybrid in the next couple of years. So, you know, things are changing. Electric vehicles are becoming more um, widely available. So that's, that's kind of the reason why I wanted to bring this up. However, looking at the presentation and having some um, conversations with staff, I do see that many, I, I guess a question for staff would be, how many um, properties will not have a garage? That's really the main question. Because in a garage, you can charge your vehicle. Every unit, uh, all, all single-family homes and all townhome units will have a garage. Perfect. So because of that, I would feel more comfortable with the variance. And I understand that we're not just, we're not just discussing this project per se, but we're also creating precedent as in policy for future developments um, that might have this sustainability question come up. Um, so, you know, as we move forward with this, we would like to specify to staff that the reason why, you know, at this point, I, 
At first, I was not in favor of the variance because I wasn't sure how many houses did not have a garage, but now that I understand that every single um, property, whether it's townhome or single family, will have a garage, then that takes that issue away. Um, but I do want to keep in mind as we look towards the future that anything, any development that does not have, you know, garages, we would not be in favor of, or I would not be in favor of. Um, but also just with- add one thing to, um, to add to the conversation. One of the conditions of approval that we do have in place is that in the HOA documents for this community, um, the parking spaces are required to be used for parking, so garages can't be used for storage. So that is another fail safe that we tried to build mm-hmm. in um, in order to approve this variance. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So my, my, my position is I am in favor of the variance because every single property has a garage. Thank you. Thank, right, thank you, you uh, Commissioner Cruz. Vice Mayor, let's turn back to you for your um, comments. Yeah, no, um, I approve this variance given just the complexity of this project. Um, you know, it is an a- HOA. I mean, I can make every argument as to why you shouldn't force anyone or force to have this project with uh, EVs because, anyway, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, but I think the point here is something that I had brought up a while ago was that the code that we have that allows the flexibility or variance for workforce housing options, it seems to be pretty broad. And I think that's something that we as a commission need to embody and kind of find out what those variances are gonna look like and identify what what are the what are the crucial and severe needs of the community right now. Is it electric charging stations? Is it housing? You know what I mean? Is it a little bit of both? Um, you know, I, I think as we move in you know, to this rapid uh, migration here in South Florida, I think it's important to have that focus and to be business friendly and make sure that we're partnering, you know, with the private sector to make sure we can provide workforce housing um, for everybody. And so I I look forward to having that conversation and whatever staff comes up with with that. Um, I I do support this. I... um, I, I guess I guess my question is just for the um, just for the the viewing you know the the cottage district you know are these is there a way f- for the residents or the future homeowners that are going to purchase these homes are there is there a possibility for them to tailor some of the color schemes I know that was something that we had talked about prior um, you know or that is this just this is the this is the product. This is for sale, and then the homeowner is going to have the ability to then tailor their home based on what the HOA, HOA docs are. Because I know we had dus- discussed previously for more of a coastal coastal theme, and just personally, you know, the gray isn't too coastal to me. But again, that's just my humble opinion. So I just wanted to get some clarification with that. Thank you. I'm A. Carlson with Pulte Homes. Um, so those were illustrative renderings. The single family, there's actually six different color schemes that range from, uh, you know, the white one, the browning, I believe, is it's our, we call it extra white. It's a very, very popular uh, mm. color scheme in all of our communities. Um, but to answer your sp- question specifically, um, I don't anticipate that the buyers would be selecting the colors, and that's just because this is a workforce housing project, and through our negotiations with the CRA, we've laid out a process um, in terms of the timing of when the units will be brought to market, and they will be under construction. We really want to have that, uh, have a very tight uh, time frame, about six months, because that's what seems to work best. If uh, folks go under contract early, like a market rate house would, and you might have a 10 to 14 month build, um, they may lose their qualification, and then that that presents a problem. Now, moving forward in the future, after someone buys the home and closes on it, the HOA would be regulating the color schemes. Those six schemes would be part of their architectural approval, and someone could come in, and if they happen to, you know, pick the gray house and think that they wanted the white one, they could repaint it in the future, Got yes. Got it, okay, no, you've answered my question perfectly. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right, thank you. I believe we've heard from all members of the commission, we've heard from staff, we've heard from the applicant. We're going to address uh, these items one by one, beginning with 8A, which is the proposed ordinance uh, 24-001 for the rezoning. 
Um, we've already had this discussion. Is there a motion? So move. We have a motion from Sorry. Vice Mayor, second from Commissioner Hay. And let's turn to our city clerk, deputy city clerk for... If I can just remind uh, the commission that the yes. two items are to be tabled until final approval for the uh, at the next hearing. So the only one that requires approval today would be the, uh, the rezoning. 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 All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll table the other two. Thank you for the reminder for that. Uh, we have a motion to second. Uh, Deputy City Clerk, if you could begin the roll call, please. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Hay? Yes. Commissioner Cruz? Yes. Vice Mayor Turkin? Yes. Vice Mayor Penserga? Okay. Yes. The vote's 5 0. All right. First reading nice. passes unanimously. Great job, everybody. Uh, now we're turning to uh, 8B. Let's have a motion to uh, table item so 8B to the next meeting. I don't know who was second. Who, okay, Commissioner Cruz was the motion to table. Second from Vice Mayor. All those in favor of tabling item 8B say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes unanimously. Item 8C, is there a motion to table item 8C to the next meeting? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Cruz, second from Commissioner Kelly. All those in favor of tabling item 8C say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes unanimously. We're now turning to section nine. It is a presentation by the Planning, Zoning, and Economic Development Department. I'm looking forward to this presentation. <clears throat> Mayor and Commissioner, my name is Achayun Kim, with Principal Planner with the Planning Zone. Here is my director. <laughs> I was waiting for a director. Okay. I apologize. I thought I had room for a bathroom break. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, uh, my name is Amanda Radigan. I am the Planning and Zoning Director, and I will be presenting um, the first part of the City Manager's report um, for the Planning and Zoning Department and um, Economic Development as well. So first, the team. Um, I introduce myself, uh, Amanda Radigan. There are two managers um, within the department, Jay and Kim who is our principal planner and is over our planning uh, group. And then John Durgan, who is our economic development manager over our EDU group. The planning team is comprised of three senior planners, Craig, Andrew, and Luis. And shout out to Andrew because he just got his AICP certification, um, which is a big milestone in a planner's career. <laughs> Um, and then we also have one planner one, which is Sabelle Baudet, and our newest hire is Michelle McLean, uh, who is a, a new position within the department uh, as a zoning technician. We also, under John, for economic development, we have two positions, uh, Michael, who is our ED coordinator, and we do have one vacant position, which we will be recruiting for soon, which will be targeting business promotion and marketing. Okay. So the division um, for planning, their, our mission is generally to guide the growth of development within the city, um, mainly around economic sustainability um, and to promote a quality of life and aesthetics within the city. We have four major areas which we work with to service the community. One, like all departments, is customer service. Um, we do have a very wide range of customers. This ranges from property owners, developers, and business owners. Our second is that we manage the DART team, which is the Development Application Review Team. This team reviews all of the major development applications within the city, and that process spans most of the departments within the city. So this process includes things like engineering, solid waste reviews, CRA, police, and fire reviews. We also manage, oversee, and apply the land development regulations for the city. This goes from enforcement to drafting of those codes. And last, and what I think is probably the most important function that we do, is we develop the long-term vision and policies for the city. And that's usually done through um, the city's comprehensive plan and for special projects. So under here is where you see things like complete streets, workforce housing, overlays, um, and coordination between departments.
Economic development, um, that division's mission is to establish a healthy environment, local economy. Um, and they do that through a, a varied, um, very different services. The first is to encourage entrepreneurship. Um, the second is focused around business retention and expansion. Um, the third is around local workforce training and strategies to connect residents to career opportunities. Um, we also act as a liaison between the city and the business community. And lastly, we administer the city's economic development incentive programs. So some of the recent accomplishments within planning and zoning. In the last year or so, we have developed um, electronic submittal for development, which is a huge deal. <laughs> we were accepting previous to this deployment um, 24 to 14 sets of plans that were each 50 pages long. Uh, very inefficient process coming from the, the developer to distributing them to all the departments. Um, so now everything is done online. We are using the SAGES program the same as the building department is. We've also deployed GRIDX, which is a 3D zoning platform. It essentially makes all of the information that comes through zoning much more accessible and legible uh, to the public. We did redo the historic preservation webpage. Um, we've had major LDR amendments, including short-term rentals, uh, tree preservations, and wireless communication registration regulations. And we've also reviewed several large-scale projects, including Baywalk, Mira Floor Apartments, the Pierce, Harbor K, Ocean One, the Town Square Master Plan, and the development agreements for that project. Economic development's recent accomplishments, um, they've administered over 383,000 in small business incentives. Um, we launched a very successful ribbon cutting program. We implemented two new small business market research analytic tools. Uh, they're both accessible on the website. They're called Size Up Boynton and Local Intel. We hosted the first inaugural black business pop-up shop in celebration of Black Business Month. This was such a great success that it will be an annual event from now on. We created for the first time economic development LinkedIn and Facebook pages to target a specific audience. We redesigned the web page also for economic development to make sure this information was accessible. And this next one I think is very important. So we actually just recently redefined the small business grant to be more accessible and better utilized, which has been very successful. Last year, I think we had one application and we left 65 or so thousand dollars that couldn't be given to small businesses. With this revamp of the grant, we gave all of our money away today, earlier, during consent. Um, so all $125,000 of both grants have been, have been utilized and will make their, way, uh, their hand, make their way into the hands of small businesses. And we've also been working with FIU to complete a draft of the economic development plan. So what I'll do next, I'll like Jayun to come up and talk a little bit about what's coming up next in planning, and then I'm going to invite John Durgan to talk a little bit about what's coming up next in economic development. Good evening, um, my name is Jayun Kim, Principal Planner. Um, so we like to go over with a few things for the, um, the, what the planning and zoning, we're working on the following items. Um, adopted, updated mobility plans, mobility fees, landscape regulations updates, um, establishment of the target overlays, um, annexation efforts and negotiations, uh, more development projects. Uh, we have a town square, north and south side plans, um, porters, townhomes along the north federal, federal highway, and 3800 South Congress Avenue industrial development will be in front of you for presentation promptly. And then we also have the lastly, um, city com comprehensive plan updates. Um, I'd like to go over with so I'd like to go over with um, comprehensive plan updates. So comprehensive plan is, um, shall provide principles and guidelines, standards and strategies for um, the future economic, social, physical, environmental, and, and um, fiscal development that uh, reflects the community and commitments to implement a plan and then cities at, and its elements. Per um, Florida statute, 
The uh, local government is required to evaluate the comprehensible plans uh, to determine if the plan amendments are necessary to reflect minimum planning period of uh, 10 years or to reflect the uh, changes in the state requirements um, at least once every seven years um, through the evaluation and appraisal reports process, also called the year process. So the comprehensible plan was um, adopted in city 1989. In 2000 and 2008, it greatly amended um, for evaluation appraisal reviews. And ever since 2008 to 2008, it gone through the minor updates. But it has not been um, evaluated, um, amended collectively or comprehensively. So go to um, in 2024, which is this year, we like to we are planning to initiate it, comprehensive plan updates. Um, there are totally nine elements. 10 elements established in the comprehensible plan. We recently adopted property rights elements last year, 2000, December 2024, so now total 11 elements. All these elements are, has been minimally updated based on the year process, but again, it has not been um, evaluated or amended collectively and comprehensively. So hoping that we are initiating these updates and then bring it to you for the, um, for the adoption. Um, the lastly, I like to, we like to um, explore to add an optional element, which is uh, economic development elements in the city's comprehensive plan. So we are here now. Economic development manager. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. John Durgan, Economic Development Manager. So what's coming in economic development? So we are in the final stages and we have a final draft this week of our uh, business resource guide. Um, this is a guide we've been working on um, with multiple departments throughout the city. Um, it's everything you need to know about operating a business in Boynton Beach that's new and existing. Um, everything from commercial uh, garbage and recycling services to um, crime prevention tips from our Boynton Beach Police Department on how to protect your business. So it's got um, multiple departments involved in it. It's a great resource. We're really excited to get that out there. So we'll have that final draft this week. And as Amanda mentioned, uh, tonight uh, you guys did uh, approve the new small business grants, uh, which is a, a huge help. It was $125,000. Um, we had $45,000 for our marketing grant and then $80,000 for our small business support grant. Um, so that was um, a very successful program. Michael Kelleher did an amazing job administering that program, and I, I do want to thank the commission for approving that tonight. The Economic uh, Development Department is also going to be working with our events division uh, on the Taste of Boynton uh, event. This is a new signature event that we'll be doing here um, in the city, and we're working with them to help the outreach um, with our restaurants, our food vendors, um, as well as our breweries, um, just to showcase all the amazing chefs and restaurants here um, in Boynton Beach. The next project that we'll be working on this year, where we're really excited about, um, is called the Business Virtual Zone. Um, what that is, is right now we have a virtual zone in our teen library. Um, it's, a, it's a sound booth in a recording studio um, that's used by teens and kids um, in the evening when they're out of school. Um, but during the day, it's not utilized while the kids are in school. So we're working with our library staff um, to allow businesses and in individuals to utilize that space during the day. Um, they have all the equipment you need to say, for example, you can record commercials, podcasts, things like that. Um, so there's a ton of tools in there, um, all the Adobe suites in there, and all to utilize for free um, is a great thing for a home-based business or a small business owner to be able to utilize that space. Um, we're also currently working with them on a new grant. Um, they're looking to purchase additional equipment for that space to really build out the space and make it more robust, um, to add a green screen, 
new cameras for photography, videography, um, things like that. So for example, if you um, own an Etsy store, um, you can come into the library and, and take beautiful, high quality, high resolution photos in that virtual zone. So it's gonna be a space tailored for small businesses. And um, I don't know of another city that has those kind of resources for small businesses here, which is um, we're very excited about. And the, uh, our teen librarians and our library staff has done an amazing job with that space. Um, and, and we're just kind of adding on to those services. And what we're also looking to do is add some new incentive programs uh, for small businesses. One of those is gonna be our vacant storefront uh, program. We've been looking in, you know, at some best practices uh, of what other cities are doing um, to really help those, those blighted areas um, where small um, business storefronts are, are, are vacant. Um, and this is just a great program that to help improve the appearance of uh, commercial storefronts um, to really re revitalize the area while they're vacant, working with the, the, the property owners um, to, to provide some artistic designs and artwork um, in front of those vacant storefronts so they're covered up. So it really helps the, the companies to the, um, to the right and left of them and also kind of beautify that area. So we're always trying to look at different incentive programs that are um, low cost, that are gonna be no cost to the business, that are low cost for staff um, and, and, the, and the public taxpayers that can be really impactful. And last but not least, I know Amanda mentioned it is going to be the implementation of our economic development plan. Um, we've been working with the uh, FIU, the, the, uh, their Metropolitan Center, on adopting this program. Uh, the, this plan, um, it's been in the works for a long time, but we're finally coming down to the final draft of it. Um, so we're really excited about this. Um, we've had a ton of community involvement in it. We had an economic uh, development stakeholders group. Um, they consisted of community and, and business leaders from all different sectors and industries um, to really provide that qualitative data um, into the process. So um, we're in the, again, we're, it's been a long time coming. They submitted their, their, their final draft of the, uh, of the competitive assessment, which is the part one, which is the data part, portion of it. Um, it's an analysis and a snapshot of the local economy. Um, in Boynton Beach, um, really looking at those trends and, and what's coming in the future economically as well as um, the current state of our city, using that data um, and developing the overall economic development plan. That's gonna be our plan of action, our, our work plan moving forward for the next number of years, identifying key strategies, policies, and investments the city can make to kind of move the city forward. Um, so again, we're really excited about this plan. Again, the next step is um, staff putting the final touches on it. Once we do that, um, we're gonna present it to the uh, city commission for adoption. We're gonna work on building out an implementation plan. So that's an annual plan that we can tie into our budget um, as we implement the, the recommendations of the plan and then um, provide periodic updates to both the city commission um, and, and the city manager. And I know Amanda, jae -Yoon and I were here to answer any questions you guys have. All right, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, let's begin on my right, Commissioner Cruz, if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Um, to all of you for your presentation. Um, something that I think we've been thinking about for a while, and I think you mentioned something along those lines, John, um, having that one-stop shop that we talked about. Um, I think it was probably our first budget. Um, wanted to kind of check in and see if that's kind of still in the works or, you know, what's the plan with that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and what we were working on is determining, I know you wanted to have a, a physical location for us. So it's not just have some sort of virtual hub for businesses, but also have a physical location. So we were in the process tr trying to identify the best place, not only in City Hall, where that location can be. Obviously, we're always here at City Hall to assist, um, but we're, we're working with the layout of the lobby on what that looks like. Um, we want to develop some sort of literature that someone can come in and, and have some sort of tangible documents that they can take with them. Um, the, the resource guide is the best first step in that foundation where we try to, it took us a little while to develop it because we didn't want to miss anything. We wanted to identify all the issues in, in those um, frequently asked questions that are always out there for a business owner. So everything you need to know about starting a business, growing a business here in the city is identified in that plan. We're identifying additional literature that the CRA has, our library has. So we're trying to combine all that right now and have a, a physical spot where they can pick that up um, as well as everything's gonna be housed on our, on our website. So the, so the resource guide's ready? 
Yeah, we, oh, we, had, the, we had the final draft. Um, Amanda and I are, are meeting on it tomorrow, so okay, we, we should really have a, a pretty exciting. We've document seen it. It so. looks fantastic. We're, we're doing our last right. kind of graphic review and edit, um, and we are planning to have it released hopefully by the end of this week or next week. Amazing. That's really great news. Um, thank you so much. That's something that I think everybody here wanted, and so we're calling it the resource guide. I love it. Um, and it's a great opportunity for anybody who may not have business ownership experience in their family, and but somebody who might be interested in opening a business and doesn't know where to start. So really excited that that's actually here next week. Um, please share it whenever it's available. Abs and absolutely. And I'd love to check it out. On, and it's going to be virtual as well. It will be virtual yeah. as well. So one of the edits that we're doing now, and, and what I really like about the virtual presence of this is that resources are not infinite within the city. So this guide actually links to other local resources, the SBA, um, county funds, state funds. Um, so it, it really does put it in one place for them. And right now we're working on making the the like links clickable, even virtually. So it should be very user friendly. It looks great. We're, gonna, we're very happy to share that with you very soon. Thank you all so much for that. That's really great. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, John, Amanda, team, uh, y'all crush it. Thank you for this. Uh, very excited about the resource guide. I think that was something that Commissioner Cruz had brought up as well, so good job with that. Um, I think that's important, you know, that, that one-stop shop. But, um, no, I mean, you guys are always impressing me, so I got nothing else to add. Thank you, guys. Commissioner Hay? I just want to thank you for the enlightenment of what's going on now. And I'm looking forward to you guys getting your hand really involved with the next item on our agenda uh, when we talk about uh, annexation. Uh, you guys will be uh, strategically involved in that. So uh, I have a lot of confidence in the direction uh, that the whole, whole group is going in. So we'll, we'll be seeing a lot of you very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. Um, I won't. I'm, I kind of ditto what everyone else said. Thank you. I think it's always important, and I, you know, thank you to the to staff and city manager for um, to deciding to take advantage of this space on the agenda to kind of highlight um, our city departments. I think it's important for um, the residents to hear what's going on and how things work, um, but also for us. I mean, we don't, um, you know. We're not doing that, you know, the every day, and and so it's nice to to see the 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 agenda items come to fruition and and, and you know be part. And so just thank you. Um, I think these are super important. Um, John, I noticed, um, and I'm I'm glad that we're going to jump on kind of the bandwagon of the vacant storefront. Um, to see what we can do because I've noticed along Congress Avenue we have a lot of new businesses um, that are coming into the city, um, which is super exciting. Um, Congress Avenue is really seeing kind of a bus, you know, kind of busting out with some new um, businesses. I know that um, Nothing Bunt Cake is coming in and. Um, there's a couple of other ones, but I've noticed that their storefronts and where they're going in, they have um, coverage and advertising. And it really catches your eye as opposed to you just looking into vacant space. And so I, I, I see it, I know it's coming, I know what's going in there and I can get excited about it. Um, so I've seen that, um, and I think that's that's great. So I love that we're going to look into that because there are some, and they're not eyesores per se, but I think that we can take advantage of a vacant storefront um, to do something, you know, some sort of advertising or, um, or, you know, or just decorative so that we're not just looking through dead space. For instance, the old Pier 1 site. Um, it is glass through and through, and you can see in, and it's just, it, I drive by, people drive by and say, what is going on? Nothing is going on. And so I know that that will come up later on, maybe down the line. Hopefully we'll see some good news. Um, but um, so I just, I thank you for that. I think that that's super important. And then, you know, kudos to the library 
and to you and planning for you know for utilizing the space that we have and and the technology um, that we've invested in the library um, and making it more accessible and known because I we've had this it's been here but it's being underutilized and I think that this is a great way um, you know especially with that business virtual zone to utilize that space and get the word out that it's here and it's available. I know that like, I know the cricket machines, I know there's a lot of other machines that get used a lot. And I think that's just come from word of mouth and getting it out there. And so I'm excited that we're doing some new things to kind of get the word out on that and uh, you know, utilize the technology that we've put into to the library especially. So thank you. I'm just going to say everything she said. So great job to all of you, and keep up the hard work. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Uh, next item, presentation by staff and discussion regarding annexation options and procedures. And Ms. Radigan. And after this item, we'll have our discussion on NLC. In the meantime, if somebody could look up those dates so uh, after we can actually discuss it once we get there, okay? Thank you so much. Um, all right, please begin. Well, we've all been waiting for it. Um, so uh, the first conversation of probably many on annexation. Uh, so first, a very broad definition on what annexation is. It is essentially the expansion of a municipal boundary. Um, there are obviously rules around what can be annexed. The kind of top ones is it has to be unincorporated, right? So we can't annex other cities. It has to be what the state statute calls um, compact and adjacent. So it needs to be next to us and it has to be one area. And the other biggest rule is that we can't create enclaves, which means we can't um, annex certain areas and leave a hole like a donut that is unannexed or county area. Annexation is governed by state statute. It is chapter 171. And there are primarily four different types of annexation methods. Uh, the first is voluntary, and this is the most common that you'll see in applications. They usually coincide with a development application. Um, it is privately initiated by a property owner, um, and they essentially petition their adjacent city to come into the city voluntarily. This is approved by the city uh, via ordinance and public hearing. The next is enclave annexation. Um, this is done via interlocal with the county. So the interlocal agreement is approved by the city commission and the county. Um, the key to this one is that you can only do it for enclaves that are less than 110 acres. And the biggest key to this is that it can only happen once the legislator finds that it meets um, the definition and criteria of an enclave. The next is legislative annexation. This area um, is when a municipality requests that a member of the county legislative delegation essentially sponsor a special act to enlarge its legal boundaries. And then the last is by referendum. Um, this is, uh, there are rules around this. You can't obviously, again, annex a municipality. Uh, there are certain reports that have to be filed with the county and it does go to a vote. The interesting tidbit I'd say about this one is that it is voters, not property owners, that make that, um, that decision. That's interesting for someone who does land entitlements because we don't let a tenant get a fence permit, but we will let tenants vote on the uh, jurisdiction <laughs> of a property. So it's, a, it's, it's interesting, definitely, and there are a few different rules to referendums and different types that as we move through this process, we can discuss in more detail. So a couple of maps I wanted to review. First, this is the Palm Beach County Municip Municipal Annexation Area Map. Um, this is a guiding map. It is not formally in their comp plan, but this is readily available on their website. As you can see, it does show the existing boundary of Boynton Beach, and that hashed area in that same color is the uh, future annexation area. You can see that that goes slightly past, um, that is military. 
So a couple more maps. This is the existing city boundary. And this map shows the Boynton Beach Utility Service Area. So here you can see the overlap between the city boundary and everything that the, our utilities department is currently servicing, but are not incorporated into the city of Boynton Beach. A very interesting tidbit about that is that we do have water service agreements with most of these properties. Most is not the right word for some of these properties. And within these agreements, there are annexation clauses. These annexation clauses essentially give us um, irrevocable power of attorney to annex them through the voluntary process. That basically says that they gave us a right to annex them at a future date if we want to. Um, these agreements went through different iterations over the last couple of decades. So not all the language is the same. Um, and there's lots of versions of this. And as you can imagine, this is um, a lot of kind of piecemealing work to tie the right agreements to the right properties. But we did some of it, so I will show you what that looks like soon. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about is the areas that are possible for annexation. So everything in blue minus what's in orange. So we cannot annex incorporated areas. So that excludes Hypoluxo, Ocean Ridge, Briny Breeze, and Gulf Stream, even though we do service them through our utilities department. Lake Clark Shores is a service area in and of itself, so we probably would not be able to annex them. And the Village of Gulf is actually an interesting one. What you're looking at is the municipal boundary plus the service area boundary, which is funny because that's all within our future annexation area. So the, over the years, since we didn't annex them, the Gulf kind of grew their utilities um, and they have been within the Gulf utility service for quite some time now. Now it's a little bit gray on whether it could be annexed or not if someone else is servicing them. For this presentation, I am excluding them. All right. The fun stuff. So here we have the properties, which I'm calling A areas, annexation areas. Um, what you are seeing right now, well, actually, first, let's do a quick example. So the property that just turned up in yellow, um, this is a good example of a property that we do have power of attorney to annex, but the red parcel we do not. So we cannot annex it because it creates an enclave. So that is not included within this study either. But the A areas in green that are shown <clears throat> um, represent all of the properties that we believe we have um, water service agreements in place, which do have power of attorney for annexation via voluntary annexation. That includes a total taxable value of $1.1 billion and a budgetary value of $9.2 million. Amanda, can I ask you to pause for one moment? Could you just... <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> there will be more. I, uh, I, I know on one hand, I want to wait until after you're done, but on the other hand, the questions are piling up and piling up. So just for this slide, uh, taxable value property taxable value, that's clear. Yes, right? taxable value. So these are rid of any exemptions, right. any, any properties that do not pay taxes. This is based on the last tax roll data. Okay, so at this present time. Yes. So it could be more um, or less. Yes. Uh, the budget value, w w could you just define that a little bit? Yes, thank you. So the, the budget value in this presentation essentially is just our millage rate. So the math here, is the taxable value times the millage rate is the operating Boynton Beach tax align. So this would be the direct impact of Got annexation. It. So what it would add to us. Yes, and this isn't all inclusive. I'll explain later. There are some ancillary increases that we would um, experience, but there are also several costs that we haven't talked about yet. But this is just the line item, like you would do a study for any one parcel during annexation. You would look at their tax va taxable value, compare it to the county taxes and the city taxes. This is the one line operating Boynton Beach. Thank you. It's also kind of important to note here that the A areas include um, 1,725 acres and approximately 12,000, uh, a population of about 12,000 people. 
They're all habited acres, to be clear. Or is it vacant? A mix. A mix. A, a mix. mix. So largely, this is a developed area. There may be some parcels that are vacant, um, but largely, this is a developed area. Any questions before I move on? Okay, so this map, what I'm calling X areas, um, X areas one through five are areas that we are still reviewing, do not have um, power of attorney, or cannot annex due to voluntary because of holdouts, enclaves, one reason or another, there's not an immediate way to annex them through the voluntary method. So these areas would um, require other means of annexation. This area totals a taxable value of 1.7 billion and a budget value of 14 million. It represents 2,700 acres and approximately a population of 22,000 people. So together, what we're looking at is a total taxable value that number is incorrect, I didn't add them. Those two numbers added together as taxable value and a total budget value of $23.3 million. Sorry, that's not that. It includes 4,400 acres. Um, for comparison, the existing city is 10,600 acres about, so 40% or so increase. And a total population of 34,000 people um, on top of our existing 84,000 people, approximately. So as I alluded to earlier, there are some ancillary revenue increases that would, um, that would affect the city. Um, things like permit, building permit fees, uh, solid waste fees, fire assessment, business tax receipts, none of that was included within this analysis. And there is obviously many additional costs that the city would um, incur, uh, personnel costs across most of the departments. We would need more planners, more policemen, more firefighters, more of everything. Capital costs in terms of vehicles and equipment. Um, we need more garbage truck drivers, more garbage trucks themselves. So there are lots of costs added to this. Um, and there would be additional maintenance fees also. So as far as next steps, immediate next steps, um, the city would undergo an interdepartmental feasibility analysis um, where this would go to each one of the department heads and essentially they would have to fill out a questionnaire and perform an analysis on impact. They would need to tell us um, how many people they would need in order to service these areas, um, what capital costs they would need, if they would be expecting revenue increases or possibly decreases, um, and this essentially touches just about every department in the city. What I am looking for today is some direction from the commission to move forward with either a feasibility analysis of A areas, of X areas, both of them, or possibly none of them. If we get direction to move forward with a feasibility analysis, we would initiate that analysis that would take some time. Um, we would start coordination with the city and county. There has been some preliminary staff conversations between county planning staff and myself. Um, and then the feasibility analysis would be brought back to this commission um, for direction at that time. I am available for any questions. All right, thank you. Who would like to go first? Let's, go, let's begin with Commissioner Kelly. Sorry, I had to step out. Do you mind, Amanda, really quick? I'm so sorry. I'd, sorry. Can okay. you, I I stepped out right after we were talking where you were showing us a and the mayor was going to ask some questions with regarding the two zones you're talking about an a zone and a z zone uh, or as x a and x uh, it was a areas and x areas so a areas can I get it to bring back the presentation I don't I don't know what I pressed um, the a areas represent areas that we do have voluntary we have power of attorney to voluntary annex them. X areas represent areas that we do not have those agreements in place, that we don't know if we have those agreements in place, or if we cannot annex them for other reasons, such as enclaves and so on and so forth. 
So it represents anything that is not a voluntary annexation. Okay, gotcha. And that, so are there any areas in what you've looked at that are primarily commercial as versus residential? And the reason I ask is commercial would, um, would benefit us on the tax end, but maybe wouldn't um, impact us as much on services um, because we're not talking about residential homes. So I'm just wondering if in your evaluation, if you've looked at areas that are, you know, maybe provide more commercial space and how in moving forward with any feasibility options, is that taken into account too where, you know, this is a commercial pocket and so, you know, this might be a little bit more, um, palatable and easier to, to grab because it's not going to, on the back end, cost as much to service as it does to... So that was not part of this specific analysis. In the feasibility analysis, the planning staff would be doing a zoning analysis. Um, when you annex property, you would have to do a zoning and land use amendment concurrent with that annexation. What I would say in general is the county and the state um, do not look highly on kind of cherry picking. Um, obviously for reasons if we are taking tax base and they have the cost of the residential areas, um, it tends to cause some complications during this process. So usually it is a balance of both. Um, you would, if you're taking commercial, you take adjoining residential. Um, is the smoothest way forward and possibly the most legally acceptable. Thank you. No, that makes sense. Um, okay, and is there, I guess what would be the con to not evaluating the, fees the feasibility of zone X? So a lot of this um, is going to end up being strategy on terms of the city. If we move forward, with annexation of the A areas only, it does reduce our ability to annex some of the other areas through specific methods. For example, one of the things that the city could do in, co in um, coordination with the county is enter into what's known as an ISBA. It's an interlocal service area boundary. Um, since we already are providing utilities, it essentially is an annexation plan. It is kind of a shared service interlocal agreement. Um, and within that, you have an annexation plan. One of those plans um, could be that you need consent from 50% of that ISBA. We have consent currently for a certain percentage under voluntary. If we annex them before we do an ISBA, we lose that opportunity to annex the X areas through that method. So it is a complicated puzzle piece. Um, and through the feasibility analysis, we will be reviewing some of those strategies and ways to, to move forward that may be most advantageous. So staff is really recommending if we move forward with a feasibility plan per se to do a feasibility on both zones so that we can look at the big picture, is that what? I, I think that that would be helpful to have all the information if we are doing it. Um, the way I am um, foreseeing this feasibility analysis go is that we will essentially, each one of these sub areas, A1, A2, A3, will kind of be their own mini analysis. So it would enable planning staff to piecemeal this in different configurations. Um, but on the other hand, the feasibility analysis is a very big undertaking and it will take resources from each of the departments. This is an analysis that requires time from staff. What's the time frame that, I mean, how long will this feasibility plan take? If all goes as planned. Perfectly. <laughs> right. Um, I would say a minimum of four months, comfortably, five or six, I think different departments will have an easier or harder time getting some of this information. Um, just as a rule of thumb, I like to 
under promise and over deliver. So it could be two months. <laughs> but I, I do think that the four month mark is probably a fair estimate. Okay, thank you. That's all I have for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. Commissioner Hay. Uh, I've been speaking about uh, annexation for quite some time because I, I realized that in this day and age, city of Boynton um, can be in a financial and space um, challenges, I'll put it that way. And one of the ways to um, come out from under all those constraints would be annexation properties around us. No, it's, it's not going to be um, an overnight thing. It's going to take time, uh, the, way, the way I see it. Uh, you presented us with uh, four different uh, annexation methods, I believe. Uh, you talked about uh, the uh, what were the voluntary and and the uh, enclave and the legislature and the uh, referendum. Um, and we you talked about yays and the X's and all that. Uh, I, naturally, I don't understand all of that like you do, but from where I sit, uh, we need to really look at it all. We need to look at both of them uh, so that we can make the best intelligent decision based on the information presented by your group and what we do our research on and find out on our own. Uh, because this is, a, as I see it, a major movement for the city of Boynton. And we need to go into this uh, with uh, eyes open as much as possible. So from my standpoint right now, in terms of the feasibil feasibility analysis, I would say include both the A's and the X's. Um, and, and what I would I, say I, is that after that feasibility analysis is done and we present to you the findings, we may be telling you that doing the X areas will be more cost prohibitive than the dollars it'll bring in. So I think that that would be helpful from that standpoint, that we'd at least have a more clear picture on where the balance is of additional revenue and income versus cost. Right, right. And I think I would reserve the rest of my questioning for, for a little bit later as I get myself a little more educated. Also, the slides that you presented here, are they available to us? Uh, yes, they were emailed, I believe, Friday, but I can send you another copy. I could put a printed set in your mailbox if you'd like. Okay, so would you send them to all of us, I guess, so we can look at them? That's all I have now, but that's the position that I... That I take right now is that look at the A's and the X's for the feasibility study. Thank you. And as we go through the dais and get everyone's uh, questions answered, could you just state also your position so this way we can have a clear idea of what the consensus is. And Commissioner Kelly, for you, it was... Sorry. Um, I... Or do you want to wait after? Yeah, I mean, I'm comfortable with a feasibility of both zones. I think that that I think that Amanda made you know that point that to to look at the big picture and look at the options. And if we do one without doing the other, then we can't ever do the other. So I think that we would put our best foot forward, knowing all of the options and what's out there. So. Thank you. Uh, I say do it all. I support both. <laughs> Let's turn to Vice Mayor. Your thoughts, questions. Yeah, I'll make, I'll make it quick. Um, Commissioner Hay, thanks for bringing this to the table. I think this is a great idea. Um, you know, we always talk about all these projects we want to do, and, you know, there's a budget shortfall, you know, every time. ARPA funds are only, you know, a lot of, a lot of funds we've received re recently are injection, right? They're not sustainable sources of revenue. And I think now we're operating with a lens of creating potentially creating sustainable re uh, revenue streams. <clears throat> and so I think, I've, for me, I would, I'll be the biggest cheerleader to move forward and look at this cost-benefit uh, analysis, right? Because that's what I need to see. Because we can, we can annex these great properties, but if the services, service cost is more 
then we're shooting ourselves in the foot. And so that's what I need to see is, you know, what's the profitability in doing this? Um, I would hope, and I'm going to pray that there, you know, that, that margin's large. Um, and then also, you know, you know, what do the residents think, right? You know, is this going to require a workshop or something? Um, is, are any of these properties commercial? Are they all residential? Is there any? It is a, it is a mix. It is a mix. Okay. So and you may have area, said that. I could have, okay. It is a mix. This represents essentially our um, western boundary all the way um, past <laughs> military trail. So all of military trail is largely commercial. Um, and it actually goes <coughs> to the canal that's just west of that, which I cannot think of the name. But it, it is past. It is west of military trail. Yep. Okay. No, thanks for clarifying that. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I definitely say let's move forward. Let's look at it. And if it makes sense, you know, let's, um, let's make it make sense. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Cruz? I'm in favor of um, doing research on both and doing the cost-benefit analysis. And I think everything else has been said before. Um, um, so I'm fine with both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before you leave, Amanda, I do want to say, as part of your, your research work, if you could just also consider when other cities have gone through this process, were there any hidden expenditures uh, that may not be typically captured in a typical cost-benefit analysis of this process, right? We don't need to reinvent the wheel or relearn the mistakes. So yes. you know, look we'll into do. that. Thank you so much. Just to... Oh, Sorry. all right. I, I spurred something. Okay. <laughs> okay. Commissioner. Um, just one recommendation would be to just take our time doing this and not rush staff Fine. to, like, we need this in four months. I think that this would be, you know, it could be a great opportunity to actually have more revenue, assuming that, you know, everything looks good. Um, but taking our time to do it mindfully and not rushing the process, um, I think it's, it's best, it's better to be safe than sorry, and it's better to get a solid foundation of, of knowledge. Thank you for that. And I would also um, just offer myself up as a resource. I'm glad to schedule one-on-ones with each of you to kind of further explore some of the strategies behind some of these methods. Um, and we can do that incrementally throughout the feasibility process. Thank you. Vice Mayor, did you have a question? No, I just, and this may have been on the previous slide, but I just want to, like, when we do this research, just to clarify, we're going to look at the, the grades of the roads also, right? Yes. We're going to look at everything, the infrastructure, yeah, everything, because what I don't, in business, you don't buy a problem. You never want to buy a problem right. because then you got to reinvest into the problem. Yes. And, so and I think that's mindful options. is a whole bird's eye view of what is this? Let's take a look, you know. Yes. And as you can imagine, as we kind of move through this and think of these things, there may be some costs associated with those. We will be sending, right. of course, staff out, but there may be things to get a more complete picture that we will need to outsource and get kind of mini studies done in order to supplement what staff can do in-house. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. Quality of roads, quality and grades, um, drainage. I mean, all yep. of the things would be encompassed with okay. this review. I just want to clarify because I think that's a, that's a big point to know. Absolutely. Um, and, I'll and then, also and then say, I mean, we could kind of like, we can kind of handpick too, right? Look at what's good and. It'll. it'll <laughs> I'm not just being straightforward, right? I mean. It'll, it'll well, help us decide what, what is most for the city. more advantageous yeah. and what it can, what it'll also do is help us create a cure plan. Mm -hmm. um, if we do annex problems or issues, they don't necessarily need to be remediated within one day. If we find major problems that we do willfully decide to take on, um, we would create cure plans for that, and that could be based on the additional income and resources that are coming. So there are some strategic ways to look at some of those areas too, because it might be in a key area that without that, it disables us from annexation, annexing areas that are very advantageous. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks for acknowledging that. That's Thank, it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda was added at the beginning of today's meeting regarding NLC, National League of Cities. Oh, this is the congressional version. Okay, so what are the dates for this? You said March, Vice Mayor? The 11th through the 13th. 11th through 13th? Mm-hmm. 
in Washington. All right, so uh, Vice Mayor, you, you requested for this discussion. I believe you just wanted to know who wanted to go. Yeah, I just I just wanted, because we're only two months out, and so I just want to make sure if anyone wants to go that we're not just trying at the last minute. Everything books up quick. I went last year, and then, you know, when I when I first started doing this, someone said, go to as many conferences as you can, right? And this and 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 I took that advice and I've learned a lot and I've very good. I've learned a lot and humbly like you know it's been I'm still learning a lot but I think the more exposure exposure you get the better um out of everything I've been to I will say this is probably one of the most helpful for me especially at, you know cuz you're at the federal level and we've gotten money back already from lobbying last year and so I would just um you know, the, I, I would highly recommend this. It was extremely helpful. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit different because at, at this one, we're all, you know, the national legal cities, you're dealing with your states and your local counties, but we're all dealing with the federal government at this, at this conference. So everybody can kind of relate, you know, because that's straight across, you know, the United States. And so um, I just wanted to bring it up. I plan on going if there's consensus and, I just want to recommend you know everyone to go because it was extremely helpful for me last year. All right, let's go around. Um, any thoughts, questions, Commissioner Cruz? Are you interested in yeah, going? I will not be attending um, this conference, but I, I do want to save my dollars for maybe another conference um, that might come up in the future. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Hay. Uh, yeah, I will be attending that one March 11th through the. 13th, which is a Monday through Friday, through Wednesday. So, yes, I will be attending. Okay. Um, Commissioner Kelly? I have to look at my home calendar. But it's something that I do want to do. If I don't do it this year, it'll be on my agenda for next year to definitely go because I know Commissioner or Vice Mayor Turkin has talked about um, just how helpful it was to get out there and, and meet with our, you know, our federal representatives and and talk to them about what's going on in in our neck of the woods so i definitely want to do it i'm going to try and go this year if not then next year yeah likewise that is my intention hopefully i'll be able to make it this year all right thank you so much everybody we are now moving on to uh, item 12 legal this is proposed ordinance number 24-002 it's a first reading i'm and sorry i wanted there was one to more comment yeah, no, 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 this is regarding 12A. If, oh, if I okay. may, I would like to make a motion to table, if I can. I did have some questions for our city attorney that um, we didn't have a chance to speak. I was in Tallahassee, and then I came back. Um, and so, you know, we're all busy today. We didn't get the, um, the opportunity to have some questions answered. All right. I don't know if there's any time sensitivity to this. I'm no, other than, um, you know, the present... Uh, there's no settlement authority right now, so you'll just be seeing all those come before you until this okay. is passed. But that's fine. Yeah. Um, next meeting. Yep. All right. Next so meeting. your request is to your. I would like to make a motion to table item 12A until next meeting. Second. All right. We have a motion from Commissioner Cruz and a second from Commissioner Hay. All those in favor of the motion to table this item to the next meeting, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. And with that, we conclude all the items on the agenda, and I want to provide everybody an opportunity for any closing comments for the evening. Commissioner Kelly, if you have anything to close or anything to add, or um, just good night. Sorry, you can skip me for now, but can you come back? Yeah, we'll come back. Commissioner Hay, closing comments. I'm good. You're good? Commis uh, Vice Mayor. Good to go. And Commissioner Cruz. No. All right. All right. Well, back to me. I found my, <laughs> I found my little note. Maybe that was too I, fast. I, well, when we were talking about... Um, electric car stations and, and all of that. If, um, I'm wondering if we can, if staff can, we can add to future, um, looking at um, kind of an, a sustainability impact where if, if we waive something like that, then maybe um, the developer, whoever, who is looking for that waiver, nothing crazy, but maybe s sponsor a charging station somewhere else or do something like that. So I don't know how possible it is, how that would work, but I'm just thinking, I don't want, obviously in this instance, they're looking for a variance because it's workforce. So you don't want to make a huge impact, financial impact to them. Sure. But at the same time, 
if we're giving them something, maybe we can, they can sponsor a charging station or something like that. So I would just like staff to maybe look at that and see if that's a feasibility. Yes, and, and Commissioner, the item still will come up again. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, well, just, there's, there's if more If we could throw that on the future, that. that would be great. Um, so we have a request, and how would you summarize that into a title? Ooh. This is a... Because what this is, is you're asking for direction to do some research, right? So it's not yet a discussion item where right. you just want to well, just... Well, I, I support... guess it has to be a discussion item because we are not... We have to get consensus to move forward with... Yeah, we'll something. get consensus to give direction to so do research. I can the talk research. to staff and yeah. kind of narrow mm -hmm. scope mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. go we'll from bring there. it back. Okay. Yeah, all right. Perfect. Sounds good. That works. We have a motion to adjourn for the evening. We'll move. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of the motion to adjourn say aye. 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 Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Stay safe and have a great year.